call on the Honourable Minister of Financial Services and Commerce. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for that um, break, which other members took up advantage of more than I did. <laughs> I didn't say older. <laughs> Don't start it. Madam Speaker, just to reiterate, I beg to move the second reading of a bill entitled the Music and Dancing Control Amendment Bill 2022. The bill has been duly moved. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak there too? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to present the bill on behalf of the government. It is a bill that seeks to amend the Music and Dancing Control Act 2019 revision, which I will refer to here on in as the Act, in order to permit background music to be played on Sundays in standalone bars and on seagoing vessels with liquor licenses. Madam Speaker, we are all aware of the detrimental effect the pandemic had on small businesses and continues to have generally, and also the importance of economic empowerment for our people. With this in mind, Madam Speaker, my team in the ministry and I, during the 2022-2023 budget process, made this matter a priority task for 2022. To review the issues and make applicable changes to the act that would be required to address the current inequity as best as possible. And that inequity being, Madam Speaker, restaurants with bars and hotels can play background music on Sundays, but standalone bars cannot under the act as it's written today. Madam Speaker, the Parliament may also recall that the member for Red Bay submitted the private member's motion three of 2021-2022 entitled Allowing Background Music in Bars on Sundays at the third meeting of the 2021-22 session of Parliament on the 9th of June, 2022. In that presentation, a member pointed out the challenges Caymanian-owned businesses have to endure given the lack of a level playing field, and while still struggling to recoup their losses experienced during the period of the pandemic. There are approximately 40 or more bars of the, in this category. Madam Speaker, the government had no fundamental difficulty with that motion and accepted it as the ministry team was working on the matter in any event, and as such, there's no need to argue just for argument's sake. Madam Speaker, following the sitting of Parliament, the ministry team and I received representations from several seagoing vessels, seagoing vessel operators, who were also prohibited from playing music for their passengers and permitting dancing on their vessels on Sundays. This is owing to the fact, Madam Speaker, that within the context of the Liquor Licensing Act, seagoing vessels fall within the definition of premises. And according to the act, being in this case the music and dancing, premises subject to this law means premises which are licensed under the Liquor Licensing Act, but do not include exempted premises. What that means in layperson's terms, Madam Speaker, is that in short, Bars and seagoing vessels in possession of a liquor license and liquor license may require or are required a music and dancing license to play music and permit dancing. Madam Speaker, this prohibition places these persons in a disadvantage, which negatively impacts their bottom lines as patrons, local and international, can choose to go to hotels and restaurants where they can enjoy music, background music on Sundays. In reviewing Madam Speaker, prior versions of this legislation, we noted that prior to the 2019 revision of the Act, and our review went back as far as 1995, all provided for a general prohibition in relation to the playing of music and dancing on Christmas Day, Good Friday, and Sundays. All versions were also, also provided the exception that music could only be played on those days at the airport, 
port areas in order to welcome passengers, restaurant or hotels between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11.45 p.m., provided that it was pre-recorded and of a soft background nature and was not to be heard beyond the boundaries of the property in which it was played. Over the years, Madam Speaker, there has been a gradual increase in the categories exempted from this prohibition. The 2019 revision significantly broadened the categories, but this never extended to standalone bars and seagoing vessels. Additionally, the 2019 revision introduced a requirement for music not to be played in excess of prescribed noise levels, but still maintain the prohibition. So with that background, Madam Speaker, the ministry continued and embarked on consultation undertaken with a number of internal government stakeholders, including the Department of Environmental Health, Department of Commerce and Investment, the Coast Guard, Department of Tourism, the Department of Children and Family Services, and the Minister's Association, as well as a group of owners and operators of standalone bars and seagoing vessels. Our aim was to be inclusive and to ensure, Madam Speaker, that as many key voices were heard as practical. The proposed amendments were largely accepted and feedback received was used to refine and finish the bill. Madam Speaker, the bill being presented today seeks to equalize economic opportunities for the owners of standalone bars and seagoing vessels. The bill also aims to balance the concerns of local business owners with the wider community and is mindful of the potential added duty this might place on enforcement agencies. Madam Speaker, I will now summarize the key amendments in the bill. The amendments will allow business owners with liquor licenses to expand services on Sundays, increasing their potential for profitability and for business growth and the subsequent growth of this sector of the economy, including some job creation. The amendments do not apply on Good Friday and Christmas days, but rather just Sundays only. The requirement is now that music being played is of a low background nature and is not capable of being heard outside of the premises in which it's played. This amendment recognizes that noise levels were previously prescribed or to be made in regulations, but that never happened. So this way, with just using the ordinary definition and be able to discern whether or not you can hear soft background music outside the premises should be sufficient. So as such, references to the prescription of decibel levels have been removed, as well as the requirement for music to be pre-recorded. The cutoff time has also been extended from 11.45 p.m. to 11.59 p.m. The amendment continues to apply to the airport the port areas as defined under the Port Authority Act, welcoming arriving passengers or, rest or restaurants or hotels that are premises subject to the Music and Dancing Control Act. Seagoing vessels can operate on Sundays but are subject to the requirement to be a half a mile out of sea before, play before music can be played and as permitted hours are between 11 a.m. and 11.59 p.m., Madam Speaker. The reference to the making of regulations by cabinet to prescribe noise levels has been removed. This in no way hampers the ability to provide for the making of regulations, but rather than having the regular making power be confined to that narrow issue of noise, it's now been extended to just general administration of the, of the act. Ultimately, um, this bill is intended to cause minimal disruption on Sundays, Madam Speaker by allowing activity that's already taking place in the restaurant and hotel sectors to be extended to standalone bars and seagoing vessels. The intention is to help to create a more level playing field, Madam Speaker, and enable these sectors to generate additional revenue. The clauses, briefly, Madam Speaker, is arranged in four clauses. Clause one of the bill provides for the short title and commencement of the legislation. Clause two, amend section two interpretation section of the Principal Act by inserting definitions of the following terms in the appropriate alphabetical sequence. Madam Speaker, the following specific amendments are being made. The defined term of bar has the meaning assigned, the meaning assigned by the Section 2 of the Liquor Licensing Act. 
definition of Port Authority means the body corporate established by Section 3 of the Port Authority Act. Definition of seagoing vessel means a vessel, A, approved by the Port Authority as being a suitable vessel for the purposes of Section 7, 7 of the Liquor Licensing Act, and B, in respect of which a retail license has been issued under Section 7, 7 of the Liquor Licensing Act. And standalone retail bar means a bar which is not located in a hotel or restaurant and in respect of which a retail license has been issued under the Liquor Licensing Act. Clause 3A, Madam Speaker, amends Section 3.2 of the Act to repeal and replace the current provision that requires music to not be played in excess of prescribed noise levels and provides instead that music being played is of a low background nature and is not capable of being heard outside the premise in which it is played. The time during which music can be played is between 9 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. Clause 3B, Madam Speaker, introduces the new subsections 3, sub 2A, and sub 2B, which provide that standalone bars and seagoing vessels, respectively, may play music or permit dancing on Sundays. The new subsection 3, 2A, provides that music may be played or dancing permitted at a standalone retail bar on Sundays with the condition that the music is required to be of a low background nature and is not capable of being heard outside of the premises in which it is played, and that that music is played between the hours of 11 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. The new subsection 3 to B provides that music may be played or dancing permitted on Sundays on a seagoing vessel with the condition that the music only be played between the hours of 11 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. The music should not be played if the vessel has to be, is at least half a mile out of, out of sea. Clause 4 amends Section 14, which establishes the regulation making power of cabinet for the purposes of administration of the Act, again, rather than being confined solely to dealing with noise levels. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, this presents, this winds up my presentation of the bill. I would like to thank the Ministry of Financial Services and Commerce and the Department of Commerce and Investment, along with all of the internal and external stakeholders that provided consultation and sites and feedback and analysis. My thanks always to the legal drafting team who assiduously worked to ensure the bill was ready for this meeting and meet the objective of completing this matter in 2022. With that, Madam Speaker, I now commend the Music and Dancing Control Amendment Bill to this Honorable House. Does any other member wish to speak? The elected member for Red Bay, the Honorable Member. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to start by thanking the Honorable Minister and the government of which he is a member for responding so thank you for responding so swiftly to the resolution of this house which followed the private member's motion which I moved about six months ago in relation to this matter. I don't recall ever a, the resolution of a private member's motion um, returning to this house in the form of a bill so swiftly ever. So I am most grateful to the member and his team. And the member has gone through the, the clauses of the bill which do, I believe, have the required effect of leveling the playing field for all, for all uh, license premises in these islands. And I'm not going to, to belabor the matter and I'm not going to go through the clauses again. I'm just simply going to say that the patrons not just the patron, the owners 
of these 40 plus local bars, I am sure will be most thankful, particularly in this festive season, that um, their patrons will have the benefit of listening to music on a Sunday afternoon and evening while they are sipping a few. And I know because a number of them have spoken to me that the, the enforcement of the provision which has been in the law for ages and the, the police actually coming around and saying, you're breaking the law by playing music on Sunday has had a, a serious um, and negative impact on some bars anyhow and their Sunday business and this Sunday crowd that came there. So all I'm going to say is thanks again to the minister and to the government on behalf of the owners and patrons of locally owned liquor licensed and premises which have music and dancing licenses. Happy Christmas. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just very briefly, to thank the member for Red Bay for his comments. I think it's an example of the House recognizing when there is an inequity to try to fix it, particularly in struggling and lean economic times. It was a pleasure to work on the bill and to be able to achieve that result. I'd also like to highlight uh, the member for word based comments about the provisions in the amendment bill, in this bill, meeting the addressing the concerns. That allows me to thank the legislative drafter Bethia Christian for drafting in such a succinct manner to be able to address this issue. With that, Madam Speaker, I would share the member of Red Bay's Christmas cheer. The question is that a bill shortly entitled Music and Dancing Control Amendment Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Music and Dancing Control Amendment Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. National Rules Authority Amendment Bill 2022. The Honorable Minister of Planning, Agriculture, Housing and Infrastructure. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of the bill entitled the National Roads Authority Amendment Bill 2022. The bill has been duly moved. Does the Honorable Minister wish to speak thereto? Madam Speaker, this bill amends the National Roads Authority Act 2016 revision to facilitate the basis of fundings for the National Roads Authority, or as known as NRA. Madam Speaker, while it is, it is a simple amendment, it is also an important one and so much as it provides the necessary increasing in funding to the NRA to move a self-sustaining through a revenue scheme that was realized from the inception of the authority. Madam Speaker, if I may, 
I would like to provide just a brief overview of this Honorable House and members of the general public. The National Roads Authority was established on the 1st of July 2004 by National Roads Authority Act. Madam Speaker, the Act provides the collection of funds from road users into central government in the form of import duties on vehicles, fuels, funds attaining from the Department of Vehicle and Driver's License, or DVDL, such as vehicle inspections, registrations, and license and driver's license fees. Madam Speaker, up until 2014, the NRA was funded by producing and selling outputs of central government, which in turn incurred in expenditures for purchasing the outputs. Having said that, Madam Speaker, while the original law provides for the establishment of road fund intended to be used to fund the purchase of these outputs, such as the facility, was seemingly not established or utilized as a result. Madam Speaker, appropriations by central government to fund purchasing purchases of NRA outputs was not uniform and as such was a distracted from the NRA's ability to plan and operate. In August of 2015, Madam Speaker, Parliament, known to us then as the Legislative Assembly, approved the amendment to the NRA Act, redefining the revenues that went into the road fund and authorized the Cabinet to transfer up to $10 million of revenue to the authority to fund its operations. In particular, Madam Speaker, the construction, upgrading, and maintenance of public roads. Madam Speaker, the net effect of the amendment in 2015 was that, that NRA now receives its funding from revenues collected by central government. Subsequently, central government no longer incurred expenditures in funding the NRA. While the amendment was welcome, welcome the change to the NRA, particularly the increase in an, in an consistency of funding, it was recognized that the arrangement would eventually have to be revised. For instance, Madam Speaker, since 2014 to 2015 budget year, we have seen the revenue of the road fund steadily increase while the NRA has constantly receive the $10 million. Convertly, Madam Speaker, and as expected, the authority has been its expense rise over the years. In other words, the authority has had to do more with the seam earlier this year. Madam Speaker, Cabinet approved an amendment in the NRA Act that authorized the transfer up to the $14 million from the Roads Fund to the authority to fund its operations. Once brought into effect, revenue to the authority will be driven or driven from two main sources that contribute to the Road Fund, those being up to the $10 million from fuel import duty collection under the Customs Tariff Act 2017 revision and up to $4 million from the motor vehicle charges collected under traffic regulations of 2021 revision. I should note, Madam Speaker, the amendment allows for funds to be a retroactive as of January of 2022. Madam Speaker, the effect of this amendment will allow central government and the NRA to benefit from its proportionality from the growth in revenues from the road transport sector. For example, Madam Speaker, there should be revenues decline. Both government and authority can re realize a decrease in funding together. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, this bill seeks to amend National Roads Authority Act 2016 revision 
in order to amend the basis of the funding for National Roads Authority. Clause 1, short title, this act may be cited as the National Roads Authority Amendment Act 2022. Clause 2, the amendment of Section 19 of the National Roads Authority, revenue that he placed into the Roads Fund to transfer to the authority to fund its operation costs. The National Roads Authority Act 2016 revision is amended in Section 19 by repealing subsection 1 and substituting the following subsection. The cabinet with effect from the 1st of January 2022 shall authorize the transfer of revenue not exceeding $14 million to the authority for the road fund for the purpose of the funding of the authority's annual operation costs, in particular the construction, upgrading and rehabilitation and maintenance of public roads. Madam Speaker, this extra funding for NRA is so important because we have, throughout the years, we have seen where NRA has always had to hire uh, a lot of temps and can only keep them on for so many ta a period of time before we had to let them go because we were stuck at that 10 million and couldn't hire them as full staff. So Madam Speaker, with this 14 million now, a lot of those temporary people that are on those temps will be able to be full-time employees now. And not only that, but their families and also will be able to have, be able to have insurance because as the temps, they weren't allowed to get insurance off of them. So this is a big, this is a big win for NRA, Mom, to be able to, and those guys that really work hard out in the hot sun out there every day doing our road works. And I really look forward to the full support of this house for this bill to pass. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? The Honorable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to offer a short contribution to the National Roads Authority Amendments Bill 2022. I'm okay, thank you. Thank the um, Honorable Minister for his, thank the Honorable Minister for his introduction to the bill and for his explanation on the background and the need for the amendment. Madam Speaker, uh, the opposition have absolutely no issue with this. Um, as, as being a former minister for NRA, <clears throat> I understand the challenges um, and the needs uh, that the NRA have and, and certainly the desires in some instances of the NRA and the minister um, versus the funding available to do so. Madam Speaker, this was an issue that we had also identified and um, we had prepared, in fact, a, and I think we had submitted a proposal to the Ministry of Finance um, prior to, to the pandemic. And that proposal, Madam Speaker, um, sought to address the issue with the, the uniformed funding for NRA by using a percentage, a fixed percentage of the roads fund as the level of funding that would be given, budgeted for the NRA. The thought process, Madam Speaker, behind that and um, perhaps someone on the other side could say whether or not they, they looked at that, was that, as the, the minister rightfully said, the, some of the main contributors to the roads fund is the fuel tax, um, the motor vehicle licensing, and certainly import duties. And now if we were to look at the issues we're facing with traffic at the moment caused one would assume, by the large amount of vehicles imported, as we heard last week when we were debating the, um, the issue, then it would reason 
then it would be reasonable to assume that as the, import, as the importation of vehicles, the licensing of vehicles, the importation of fuel to service those vehicles go up, the demand would go up for the NRA to build roads, um, to maintain the roads in order to deal with the increases. And then, Madam Speaker, if the demand goes down, the fuel importation reduces, the vehicle importation reduces, the licensing of vehicles reduces, then the NRA budget would adjust itself back down in line with its needs. That was a thought process that we had um, when reviewing this issue and the idea, as I said, was to affix a percentage of the roads fund to the NRA budget. Madam Speaker, I am happy that the minister was able to get this through his cabinet and bring it here this evening because I've always maintained, Madam Speaker, that the road network in the Cayman Islands is one of the, if one of, if not the government's largest fixed assets. And if you were to actually look at the percentage of the budget for NRA versus the value of that asset, it's minute. It's minute. It, it's less than 1%, Madam Speaker. So I'm happy to see this. I would not leave it at this because you'll always be coming back um, uh, to the parliament as, 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 as the population changes, as the importation of vehicles changes, et cetera. And I, I would humbly recommend that perhaps the minister and his team have a look um, at the thought process that we were undertaking where the NRA budget is affixed to a percentage of that roads fund. Otherwise, from that, we have absolutely no problem in supporting this um, government bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? Madam Speaker, um, I just want to, <laughs> Madam Speaker, as, um, I just want to get up here to thank the House for their full support on this amendment to this um, NRA bill. It is with great pleasure and I'm pretty sure that the, the people that are listening that work with NRA, especially those that are on the temps, are happy to know that this extra funding is coming so that they can no longer have to be on temporary, and that alone should be a Christmas gift going to them, knowing that next year that they will be full employees and their family know that they'll be full employees, and those that need the insurance will know that they are covered from here on out. I want to thank everybody in this house for that support. The question is that a bill shortly entitled National Roads Authority Amendment Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The National Roads Authority Amendment Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Utility Regulation and Competition Amendment Bill 2022. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of the Utility and Regulation Competition Amendment Bill 2022. The bill has been duly moved. Does the mover wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker, briefly. That one. I can afford them back to back, you know, believe in me. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, 
The amendment primarily addresses some long-standing governance issues for the Utility and Competition Regulatory Office, otherwise known as OFREG, and allow for changes to the constitution of the Board of Directors. Madam Speaker, as members would may recall, OFREG was formed in 2017 on the recommendation of the EY Project Future Report to amalgamate the, I the Information Technology and Communication Authority, previously known as the ICTA, the Electricity Regulatory Authority, ERA, and the Ministry of Fuels Inspectorate. Water and wastewater services were added to OFREG remit at a later date. Madam Speaker, unfortunately, the required change management process was not undertaken at the time of the amalgamation, which led to little real integration of the regulated sectors. As a result, the efficiency and economies of scale which were predicted were never fully realized. A restructuring exercise is currently on the way to achieve a one-off reg that will improve the efficiency and cost effectiveness of the organization. The end goal of the legal amendments is to ensure that OFREG is duly equipped to ensure that it can seamlessly fulfill its objectives and that its supporting legislation is fit for purpose. Madam Speaker, the amendments currently under consideration constitute the initial stage of a total revision of the law with further amendments coming to this Honorable House next year. The current changes to the existing laws seek to correct non-compliance with the Public Authorities Act, enact the recommendations of the Auditor General, and meet the overall need to improve corporate governance. Madam Speaker, I would like to explain the five changes to the existing law which are contained in the amendment bill. Under the First Amendment, the membership of the OFREG Board will be increased to 11 members, including the chairperson, with nine non-executive members and the chief executive officer as an ex officio member. This change will provide extra members to sit on the various sector committees that will be set up to deal with increasing business demands. At present, the board consists of a chairperson and five non-executive members. The second amendment relates to section 18.2 of the Act, which will replace the cabinet secretary as the chairperson of the nominating committee with the chief officer of the ministry with responsibility for OFREG. Further consequential amendments to this effect were made in sections 19 and 21, effectively replacing references to cabinet secretary with chief officer. The third amendment, Madam Speaker, as per recommendation of the Office of the Auditor General's report on the efficiency and effectiveness of OFREG 2020, removes the executive directors and chief fuel inspector from the board membership. The executive directors of OFREG, except the non-voting CEO, are to be removed from the board and are to be advisors at the committee level, for example, on the regulatory committees. The Fourth Amendment will mandate that the chairman of the Risk and Audit Committee shall be a member of the current board and not come from outside the organization, as is currently the case. The AAG's report specified that the chairperson of the Risk and Audit Committee should be appointed from the members of the board. The rationale for this recommendation references international best practice while also outlining the importance of the chair of the Risk and Audit Committee, fully knowing and understanding the context of the issues that he or she may be addressing. I believe this change will strengthen the work of this committee and the enterprise risk management regime which is currently being put in place. Under the Fifth Amendment of the law, the government will indemnify the board and staff of OFREG for actions taken in good faith during the delivery of their duties. Madam Speaker, Section 110 of the Act currently leaves OFREG employees exposed to the expense and distress of the civil court process in the event that something adverse occurs during the course of their official duties, even if they act in good faith. The change will bring OFREG in line with other government regulators with regards to indemnity, one example being the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority. Madam Speaker, as I have outlined, the amendments put forward to the URCA addresses some critical governance and operational gaps in the functioning of OFREG. The government recognizes that being only five years old, OFREG is still in its infancy and some growing pains are inevitable. 
In the coming months, there will be further proposed amendments to this legislation as the Ministry continues to mobilize recommendations from the OAG and the Public Accounts Committee reports that will provide for greater regulatory oversight of the industries under OFREX purview. Madam Speaker, I believe that the changes are being, uh, sorry, I believe that the changes that are being proposed to the existing law will improve corporate governance and further develop the regulator to be more efficient and effective. I therefore recommend the Utility Regulations and Competitive Amendment Bill 2020 for the favorable consideration of this Honorable House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Very briefly, Madam Speaker, I rise on behalf of the Opposition to make this short contribution to the debate on this bill. Amendment Bill just entitled Utility, Regulation and Competition. Amendment Bill 2022. Madam Speaker, the opposition have taken note of the, uh, the proposed, the five proposed amendments before that the bill is seeking to make. And to be honest, uh, Madam Speaker, we, these amendments to us appear very straightforward, non-controversial, and really, they don't cause us any concern. And so I'm very happy to say this evening, we'll support the amendments and the bill as it is presently drafted. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? Madam Speaker, thank you very much. I just want to thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition and all the members of the Parliament for their tacit approval of this important bill. Um, as I said before, it is the start of what is to come. The government, and I'm sure the public, remains um, that there are challenges with OFREG that we'll be looking to deal with. And at this point, I also want to um, thank His Excellency the Governor for his um, support and actually um, helping us to get some additional technical um, ex um, expertise from the United Kingdom that will help us to put some teeth in the current legislation so we can get OFREG to fulfill its mandate. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question is that a bill shortly entitled Utility Regulation and Competition Amendment Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Utility Regulation and Competition Amendment Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Customs and Border Control Amendment Bill 2022. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of the Customs and Border Control Amendment Bill 2022. The bill has been duly moved. Does the mover wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker. I don't think this one will be that brief. And the, the bill is attached to it, man. It's not that. Matter of fact, let me remove the bill from the back of these documents so I don't frighten, yeah, frighten the members. Madam Speaker, we are in the midst of a crisis. The continued arrival of increasing numbers of irregular migrants to our shores, primarily from Cuba, is a crisis with serious economic and national security implications for our islands. And as it is a crisis that is worsening every day. Madam Speaker, irregular migration of this nature is not new to us. In 1994, the Cayman Islands experienced an influx of over 1,100 irregular migrants from Cuba over a very relatively short period. That experience overwhelmed our government agencies and left long lasting financial consequences and also social consequences. Madam Speaker, it was to prevent such a situation reoccurring that the Cayman Islands government signed a memorandum of understanding with the government of Cuba in 1999 that provided for the repatriation of Cuban migrants who entered the Cayman Islands irregularly. That document was expanded in 2015 to set up more detailed procedures and timeline 
for the exchange of information between our two governments to keep the time between arrival and repatriation as short as possible. This ensures that the migrants are repatriated to their families with the minimum delay and the cost of maintaining migrants long term are reduced. I would like to inform this House, Madam Speaker, that just last week, officials were engaged in talks with a visiting delegation from the Cuban government with respect to the current situation and matters covered by the Memorandum of Understanding. Between 2015 and 2021, the number of migrants reaching our shores was little more than a trickle, ranging between one and five each year. However, Madam Speaker, the relative calm came to an end early this year. With Cuba's economic situation deteriorating and living standards falling and then made worse by the devastation caused by Hurricane Ian in September, Cubans are again taken to the seas in large numbers to seek a better life elsewhere, and many are reaching our shores. From April until now, Madam Speaker, 353 undocumented migrants from Cuba have arrived in the Cayman Islands. 100 alone in October, and arrivals are continuing almost daily. As of today, there are a total of 350 migrants here at various stages of processing. This significant increase in arrivals is putting a severe strain on the Customs and Border Control Agency from a logistical point of view, both in Grand Cayman and Cayman Brac. Several other agencies are also working quickly to create additional accommodation for these migrants. From a financial perspective, there are serious implications. The cost of migrant maintenance and accommodation from January to the end of October 2022 is slightly over $1.6 million. Given increase in numbers and the need for additional security measures, it is projected that the cost for November and December alone will be an additional $1.3 million bringing the year-end estimated total to over $2.9 million. As a result, Madam Speaker, supplementary, supplementary appropriations will be required in order to meet those costs. It is imperative, Madam Speaker, that we shorten the average length of stay. The magnitude of the financial burden is directly related to the length of time that a migrant remains in the Cayman Islands. Although the MOU with the Cuban government sets out timelines for the exchange of information, the actual length of time that a migrant remains in the Cayman Islands depends on how long it takes to process the application for asylum and any subsequent appeal to the Refugee Protection Appeals Tribunal. It should be pointed out that almost all migrants arriving in the Cayman Islands exercise the ability to apply for asylum and their right of appeal where the application is refused. There is, often a further, there is often a further delay after these matters have been concluded while we await approval from the Cuban government for the transportation back to Cuba. Currently, the average length of time that a migrant remains in the Cayman Islands is nine months. At an approximate monthly cost of 1,300 per migrant, this amounts to a total average cost from arrival to repatriation of 11,700 per migrant. This figure does not take into account the cost of inter-island travel and transfer transportation back to Cuba. This can add significantly to the overall cost given that, for security reasons, it is often necessary to charter a Cayman Airways jet for the journey to accommodate the migrants, as well as require two escorts per migrant from CBC. While these processes are thorough and in accord with their obligations under the 1951 UN Refugee Convention, and an MOU with Cuba, they are laborious and not geared towards mass arrivals. Cabinet has therefore approved a number of important changes that will streamline the way in which asylum applications and appeals are processed while continuing to observe our international obligations. Some of the changes in the bill are also intended to act as a deterrent to those who may contemplate seeking a refuge in the Cayman Islands even though they are not fleeing persecution. Madam Speaker, for the benefit of the public listening and watching, I will go through the main changes contained in the bill. The first important change is that the Director of CBC and the Refugee Protection Appeals Tribunal will be required to apply a higher standard when assessing whether an applicant for asylum has demonstrated a well-founded fear of persecution. 
Specifically, Madam Speaker, it must be determined on the balance of probabilities whether the asylum seeker has a characteristic which could cause them to fear persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion, and if they do in fact fear such persecution in their country of nationality as a result of that characteristic. Secondly, once this has been decided, it must be determined whether there is reasonable likelihood that if the asylum seeker were returned to their country, they would one, be persecuted as a result of that particular characteristic, and two, they would not be pro protected from, the, from persecution by that country. This new balance of probability standard, which mirrors a recent change in the UK, is higher than the standard used currently in the Cayman Islands, which is a reasonable degree of likelihood. The second change, Madam Speaker, is that the power to approve or refuse an application for asylum is being expanded. Currently, only the CBC director has the legal authority to grant or refuse an application for asylum. In future, the director will be able to delegate his decision-making powers to a CBC officer of the rank of assistant director or above. This will allow decisions to be taken much more quickly. Further, Madam Speaker, a person granted asylum will no longer receive indefinite leave to remain in the Cayman Islands from the outset. They will instead be granted leave to remain for three years. Towards the end of this period, they may apply for a review of their leave to remain, and if they still meet the criteria for refugee protection, this will be converted to indefinite leave to remain. If they do not meet the criteria, they'll be required to leave the jurisdiction. This two-stage two approach mirrors the UK model. Madam Speaker, I just want to kind of pause here, and this is one of the things that we recognize under the current system. We are people who have been given asylum for different reasons. The minute it has been granted, we find that they've been traveling regularly back and forth to Cuba. And then the question is, if you had fear all of this, then all of a sudden the traveling back and forth, we realize that in itself seems some level of inconsistency. And that's one of the reasons why we looked at the UK model in terms of what is that they were doing and removed the indefinite leave where it is actually reviewed periodically. Madam Speaker, to prevent the appeals process being used to prolong the person's stay in the Cayman Islands, where the director of CBC is of the opinion that an application is without substance, he will have the power, when refusing an application, to certify it's clearly unfounded. To, sorry, to certify it as clearly unfounded. This could be on the basis of information given during the migrant's initial interview upon arrival in the Cayman Islands or after a full asylum interview and where an application has been certified in this way, the applicant will not have a right of appeal to the Refugee Protection Appeals Tribunal. These changes will reduce the number of persons who need to undergo a full asylum interview and subsequent assessment, thereby reducing the length of time they are in the Cayman Islands before repatriation. This certification mechanism and absence of a right of appeal mirrors the UK policy with respect to asylum applications. I should add, though that individuals who have their asylum application rejected on this basis will still have access to the courts through, through judicial review. Madam Speaker, another important change allows CBC to deem that a migrant has abandoned their asylum application where the person fails, without good reason, to attend their scheduled asylum interview or avoid service of documents requiring them to attend an interview or appointment. Offenses are also being introduced relating to the giving of false or misleading information with respect to an application for asylum. Where an applicant makes a false statement, fraudulently alters any document, or uses or possesses a forged or irregular passport, he or she will be liable on summer conviction to imprisonment for two years. With regards to appeals, Madam Speaker, the sequence of events during the appeal process is being streamlined to allow for faster disposal of appeals. Under a change to section 111 of the Act, a person whose application for asylum has been refused will be given the full reasons for the refusal at the time that they are notified of the refusal. They will therefore be expected to provide their detailed grounds of appeal 
at the time of lodging their appeal. The CBC director will then have 14 days in which to lodge a written defense with the Refugee Protection Appeals Tribunal. Once this has been received, the tribunal will proceed with the appeal. The composition of the Refugees Protection Appeals Tribunal is also being expanded, Madam Speaker. Currently, the tribunal only has five members. Going forward, the tribunal will have a chairperson, up to five deputy chairpersons, and a panel of members. This will allow the tribunal to sit in up to six divisions simultaneously or otherwise. This change will significantly reduce the waiting time for appeals to be heard. I should note, Madam Speaker, that the changes I have just explained will only apply to asylum applications and appeals that I receive after the date on which this bill is enacted and comes into force. All applications received before that date will be processed in line with the existing provisions of the Act. Madam Speaker, in concluding my introduction of this bill, I wish to thank all those individuals from as many parts of the civil service and indeed the Office of the Governor who are involved daily in managing the many challenges that we are facing, both operationally and from a policy perspective, as a result of this migrant crisis. I want them to know that their dedication is fully recognized and appreciated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby recommend the Customs and Border Control Amendment Bill 2022 for the favorable consideration of this honorable house. Before I ask if any other member wishes to speak, just like to remind members that although your microphones are not on, um, it's quite loud when members are speaking, so please just keep it down while someone is on the mic. Does anyone else wish to speak? The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise on behalf of the Opposition to make this short contribution to the debate on a bill entitled Customs and Border Control Amendment Bill 2022. Madam Speaker, I note that the bill, the bill seeks to amend the procedures relating to application for asylum with a view to facilitating faster decision making while continuing to observe and maintain our obligations and meet our obligations under the convention relating to the statute of refugees, status of refugees. In other words, Madam Speaker, the bill seeks to allow government to deal more effectively, fairly and efficiently with the growing influx of Cuban refugees and Cuban migrants arriving by boat on our shores. This is an issue of grave concern to us, and I have no doubt of everyone else in this parliament. And while not yet of the same magnitude and proportions, Madam Speaker, it is somewhat reminiscent of the massive Cuban refugee crisis that we experienced in the early 1980s. Madam Speaker, Amongst other things, the bill seeks to allow the director to de delegate his powers under the act to an officer of the rank of assistant director of above. It seems logical and will enable applications to be dealt with more expeditiously, allow migrants who do not qualify as political refugees to be repatriated to their homeland more timely. It also gives successful applicants leave to remain in the island for three years and provides that applications for indefinite leave to remain be made after two. Provision is also made for dealing with the unfounded applications and circumstances where applications may be treated as abandoned or withdrawn. Most importantly, the director will now be required to give reasons why an application is refused at the time that the applicant is notified of the decision. I also note too, Madam Speaker, the proposed increases in the membership of the Ref Refugee Protection Appeals Tribunal to allow for up to six trans uh, tribunals to sit simultaneously or otherwise, and each tribunal will be presided over by the chair and no fewer than two other members. Madam Speaker, in listening to the Minister's presentation of the bill, I didn't hear him say whether, in addition to the Secretary's additional resources uh, will be required at the administrative level um, to support the significant expansion of the tribunals. And I do suspect that it will. But I wonder, therefore, if we could ask the minister on his wind up, if he could tell us whether additional, confirm that additional resources will be needed and whether these resources exist internally or we, whether they'll, we'll have to do some sort of recruitment 
to, to bring in the, the, the resources to deal with the situation that we are currently facing. Madam Speaker, to the opposition, these amendments are timely. They are reflect a much needed response to the growing Cuban refugee crisis. There's hardly a day, Madam Speaker, that passes where we don't hear or read of another boatload of Cuban refugees arriving on our shores. It is important that we have the proper processes and support in place to allow the CBC to effectively discharge their duties and responsibilities. And it is important that we try to deal with these migra irregular migrants as expeditiously as possible and uh, ensure that those who do not qualify to remain here are repatriated and those that do, their applications for asylum are actually dealt with quite expeditiously. I know it could take up, at the moment, it could take many years beyond the three that we're look, looking to do here before these uh, applications actually make it before uh, a tribunal for adjudication. And so, Madam Speaker, the opposition supports the bill, and uh, we commend it also. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? The Honorable Deputy Governor. Madam Speaker, thank you. I will be brief. I th the Deputy Premier did an outstanding job presenting the bill, covered um, the vast majority of the points that I wanted to make. But I do want to, to say, Madam Speaker, the Deputy Premier mentioned the Cuban refugee crisis that we had in 1994, and that number of 1,183 Cubans still stays in my mind because it was... A real, a real crisis. But the benefits, that, or what has changed since then, is back then we had no knowledge of how to deal with uh, persons who were uh, claiming refugee status. We had no legislation to, um, to govern the entire process. Now we do, and that legislation that is in force at the moment is a bit dated, and that's the reason why uh, this bill is, is being brought today. It really modernizes the provisions that we have rela in relation to the granting of uh, refugee status and how we process um, persons who arrive in the island and who claim um, asylum. Um, and I want to commend the Deputy Premier, the Chief Officer Howell, uh, Mr. Clifford at, the, um, at CBC, and all of his team who has worked really hard over the past year uh, to process the, the Cuban migrants. As we said, we had 100 Cubans arrive um, in the month of October alone. Um, Madam Speaker, the vast majority of those persons have been interviewed uh, by CBC, and that's a huge job. You know, you're, not, you're not just asking a Cuban migrant or anyone who claims asylum five questions you have to go into in-depth um, interviews to determine you know, why that person is, is claiming asylum. Are they really fearing um, persecution for one of the UN convention reasons? And you test their story. So to, to, to get to where we are today, where I would say that the vast majority of every migrant that have arrived in the Cayman Islands has already been interviewed um, by CBC and the process now to um, get the decision letters out. Some persons, many, many have been refused and, have, and we are in the appeals process. But everything that we are doing today, Madam Speaker, is designed to speed up the process because that is what is going to reduce the number of Cuban migrants who come to this island, who are economic migrants, but who say that they are refugees is that when our system becomes very efficient, you then realize, you know what, it doesn't make sense for me to go to Cayman because I'm gonna claim asylum, and 30 days later, if, I'm deci if, it's, if it's determined that I'm not a, a, a genuine refugee, I'm gonna get sent back to where I came from, so it doesn't make sense for me to, to try a thing um, in the Cayman Islands. That's where we want to go. But we also want, Madam Speaker, to live up to our obligations under the UN Convention. The last thing we want 
as a country is to send back someone who is being persecuted. Uh, you could possibly send someone back to their death. So the CBC, the government, takes our obligations very seriously under the UN Convention, and again, that is why we are bringing the um, bill here today. Madam Speaker, I've been hearing a lot recently about the Cubans, and it's been on talk shows, and it has been uh, becoming a somewhat of a vexed issue. And persons have been saying, why don't we just give them some food and water and push them on their way? Well, Madam Speaker, in my early days at immigration, that's exactly what we did. And that caused numerous issues, not one. One was we were running the risk as a, as a jurisdiction of being branded as a country that supported illegal immigration, because that's what we would be doing. If someone turned up our shores and we gave them food and water, we gave them, we fixed up their boats and said, on you go to another jurisdiction, we are then supporting illegal immigration. And we certainly wouldn't want anyone to do that to us. If the Jamaican authorities had 600 Haitians arrive and they fixed up their boats and said, go ahead down to Cayman, you'll be okay there, we certainly would be complaining. We have an obligation, an international obligation, to be a responsible jurisdiction. We have an obligation to be uh, a responsible neighbor to the countries around us, and we have an obligation not to support illegal immigration. That's number one. Number two, we're talking about safety. And we don't know whether persons who we have allowed to repair their vessels is going to make it out to pass the reef. So we are putting person's life in jeopardy if we sort of say, sorry, um, can't stay here, let me give you some food and water, and I hope you make it to um, your next um, jurisdiction. So I want the public to realize that the government is doing the responsible thing. I, I pay close attention to uh, this particular area. I, it's still in my blood, I think, from my days at immigration, and I see recently other countries being named as supporters of illegal immigration because they're not doing enough to be responsible to police their borders but also prevent persons from using their jurisdiction as an in-transit point to enter other countries illegally. Madam Speaker, this bill is innovative. It is up-to-date. It brings our legislation up-to-date with the latest thinking on asylum and immigration. I thank the minister, the deputy premier. He has been um, a proponent of this from, from day one. He has recognized the issues and he has brought this bill to parliament. And I want to congratulate him and his ministry. And like I said, I do want to give a big shout out to the members of CBC who have been working night and day dealing with these uh, migrants in Grand Cayman and in Cayman Brock. Uh, we've seen a total joined up approach. Uh, we have members of the prison service, the regiment, uh, the police, everyone has been working together for one common cause and that is to meet our international obligations. So I, as head of the civil service, I do want to, to thank all everyone who has been involved in dealing with these migrants. And I think it's safe to say with these changes, uh, these amendments, we will be able to now process persons who come into our island, who claim asylum, quicker, faster, and in a very modern way. I thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any, the Honorable Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just wish to um, rise to briefly lend my voice to the proposed amendment as reflected in the reflected in the Customs and Border Control Amendment Bill 2022. Madam Speaker, much has been said in terms of the the trigger, if I might put it that way, 
for, for these amendments. And we heard some staggering statistics outlined by the Honorable Deputy Premier, um, 353 uh, since the beginning of April, uh, 100 alone in, in October alone, uh, and a running cost of our expenses of 1.6 million so far, and a potential 1.3 million to the end of December, Madam Speaker, which could add up, to a, add up to a grand total of close to $3 million. Uh, Madam Speaker, for a small jurisdiction like ours, it is staggering. And it is true, Madam Speaker, that the Cayman Islands has shown enormous generosity, if I might put it that way, in deal, dealing with these migrants, Madam Speaker. Um, there is a lot of sympathy in the community for them. I understand every so, Madam Speaker. There are persons who are genuinely fleeing from, well, because they have well-founded fear of persecution. There are others who are fleeing for, as you heard others say, economic reasons. Um, neither of which, Madam Speaker, are easy and, and acceptable. The fact of the matter is that there, there are hardships being felt all around. And so, understandably, there is a, a, a push factor. What do you call it? Yes? A, a pull and a push factor to, um, that is causing uh, these people to make these dangerous journeys, dangerous trips across the seas to get to other places, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, there is just so much more that a country can take and no more. And what is clear is that some of the generosity uh, being displayed here is at times and being abused. And what the government is attempting to do is to strike the right balance, Madam Speaker, in dealing with those who have demonstrated well-found fear of persecution and those who are not in that boat, but who are here or who have made the journey across and are sort of abusing, if you will, the generosity being offered by the Kimberlands government and its people. And some of the speaker, the, the measures being put in place is really aimed at, as I said, striking the right balance. And so the applicants for asylum will now be required to uh, demonstrate or meet a much higher standard of proof in order to be able to qualify for asylum. It's, it's more like a two-stage two test, which is consistent with what the United Kingdom itself has done for asylum seekers. So there's just no um, no more case of simply saying that I have a well-founded fear of persecution. They'll have to demonstrate a bit more than that, Madam Speaker. Not only that, but there are persons who fall into the category who would be subject to such a well-founded fear or subject to persecution, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm sure there are those who will be able to do so. But there are those who, as you heard, Madam Speaker, their application is without merit. And so the need for the certification process, Madam Speaker, and what that certainly does is when they are first engaged, if their story or the, the information that they provide is clearly devoid of any merits, um, as it relates to well-founded persecution, then the case will be certified as totally devoid of merit, and there will not be an appeal. Madam Speaker, they would then be fast-tracked, if I might put it that way, for return, 
But of course, they have other remedy if they wish. They can still um, petition the Grand Court for well, file application for judicial review in the Grand Court. In addition to that, Madam Speaker, even if they return to their homeland, they can still pursue their judicial review from abroad. There's nothing to prevent them from doing so. So they're not totally devoid of, of redress. But Madam Speaker, whatever is being done, you heard, uh, we have to ensure that the UK slash Cayman Islands international obligations are observed and where applicable, Madam Speaker, the relevant Bill of Rights safeguards are in place to deal with these, uh, these applicants. So all of those matters are being, will have to be uh, borne in mind when dealing with, or treating with these, these applications and these applicants. Madam Speaker, there will be no need, there will be no longer this indefinite leave, uh, but instead we will be subject to periodic review. And you heard the, one of the reasons, Madam Speaker, for that being articulated by the Honorable Deputy Premier. It is not unheard of that once they are granted asylum, then they are on a fortnightly trek back and forth to Cuba and involved in commerce, among other things, Madam Speaker. And so it begs the question whether, in fact, there was any well-founded fear in the first place of, of, of persecution. Uh, Madam Speaker, it, it is not, it is not um, unheard of, as I spoke about the certification earlier on, about not having any merits. It is not unheard of, Madam Speaker, I'm advised that when they are first um, questioned, their story invariably is heavily weighted in favor of persons who are economic migrant or economic refugee, if I might put it that way. And under the current construct we have, Madam Speaker, once they are put in the queue to be dealt with, by the time they get to the appeal stage, somehow that story is morphed into a well-crafted, well-honed, uh, well-honed, ground of appeal with all the relevant jargons and everything that you would expect to find in an asylum application. It, somehow the story changed dramatically and nothing that was said initially um, finds its way into the, the appeal brief. It's a completely different brief altogether. And, and it begs the question, what has happened between then and the time it gets to the appeal stage? So it is not an unreasonable position being taken by the government, Madam Speaker, because it seems to be that their memory and their understanding of the well-founded fear it seems to improve with the passage of time between being taxed initially, being, being um, interviewed initially, and the time of the filing of their grounds of appeal, Madam Speaker. Um, also, this issue of trying to provide adequate reasons at the very outset, once the application is dismissed, is also not a commendable move on the part of the government, Madam Speaker. The Constitution requires a Section 19 that persons who are affected by adverse decisions of public authority should be provided with written reasons. Um, if they demand it, of course, but in this case, they're, they're still given the reasons, which is quite commendable. But they have the reasons. And so they have the basis on which to um, make a decision whether to file an appeal or whether to whatever you need to file judicial review. And Madam Speaker, they haven't been so informed. It, it seems that some of them are fairly reasonably resourced because they you some of them end up with legal representation, again, which they ought not to be denied. That's also commendable. 
But all is not lost for them, Madam Speaker. But what is also happening is that somewhere, once they, somewhere along the way, once they get to a certain stage where they're supposed to be served with certain documents from the Secretariat to prosecute their appeal, they then, it appears, Madam Speaker, start to evade the service. And so they are, you are unable to find them. Um, and so what is happening is that they then buy time in doing so. They are unable to be found, can't be served, and so they, it, it lengthens their, their stay um, and, and uh, cause the process to be dragged out indefinitely, Madam Speaker. So the idea of deeming them to have abandoned their appeal or abandoned the process, again, is not an unreasonable um, way to treat with the matter, provided, Madam Speaker, that there's demonstrable evidence to, to prove that every efforts have been made to serve them um, either at their known address or some other known places or otherwise. And, and those attempts have been well documented and is available, uh, Madam Speaker. So, <clears throat> sorry, that in, in itself is also something that will, an effort or move that will help to expedite the process. There is no longer an incentive, Madam Speaker, for them not wanting to prosecute their appeal. Madam Speaker, finally, in terms of the expansion of the Appeals Tribunal, that again is an extremely sensible, common sense way to treat with the matter. Um, there is a growing number of, of, of migrants around, uh, on the ground. And even though the bill itself Madam Speaker, the, some of the provisions of the bill will not, will not be retrospective or retroactive. The aspect of it that deals with the expansion of the, the numbers of, of commissioners, of um, persons who sit on the appeal tribunal will not be affected by the, those considerations. Um, it has nothing to do with evidence and, and what have you. This is just administratively having more bodies being able to deal with the number of appeal. So that, Madam Speaker, will help to expedite the processing or the hearing of the appeals where there are appeals to be heard, Madam Speaker. So all in all, um, it is a commendable effort, Madam Speaker, to deal with a growing, growing crisis and the, the assurance that I want to left the public with, with Madam Speaker is that all of this is being done, but with ensuring that the necessary convention, convention and obligation under the convention are being observed and also where applicable, the necessary provisions of um, the Bill of Rights are also being observed. So they are all the usual safeguards for due process, Madam Speaker. I thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? Yes, Madam Speaker, briefly. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Deputy Governor, and the Honorable Attorney General for their contribution to the amendments to this bill. And I'd also like to thank Madam Speaker, all my colleagues, and all other members in this um, Honorable House for their tacit um, support of this bill. Madam Speaker, I just want to put it out there so people can understand um, two things. One, the government deliberated very heavily on this topic. And the reason for that, Madam Speaker, is that the government is mindful 
of the number of Cubans who have made the Cayman Islands their home and have contributed greatly to our society. Many of them that the Honorable Deputy Governor referenced back from the days of um, Ten City are now good, upstanding, decent Cayman and has contributed um, both in the public and within the private sector. Um, two, the government also remains cognizant, Madam Speaker, of the Cayman Islands' strong historical ties with the um, island of Cuba. As some, would, um, well, some members may not know, but my um, grandmother on my father's side actually migrated to the Cayman Islands from Cuba in the early 60s, having decided at that time not to return to Jamaica. But you know, after the whole Cuban Revolution issue, she decided to actually make the Cayman Islands home. And it's when she moved there, she sent, to, she sent for my father. So we do understand the historical ties and the traditional ties that many people in the Cayman Islands have with the island of Cuba. We are also cognizant, Madam Speaker, of the Cubans' reliance very heavily on the Russian economy, and that Russia at this point is actually at war with Ukraine. And as such, many assistance that was normally given to Cuba, provided to Cuba from the Russian government, has now been in its own issues. So between that, Madam Speaker, coupled with the recent COVID pandemic, we recognize that the economic challenges and economic situations in Cuba is actually quite dire at this time. And as a father and as a parent, you know, when we do look at some of the boats that people arrive here in, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, what can be the motivation for someone to, you know, take a, a craft of that size and, you know, to, to traverse the waters to make a better life. So we are very cognizant and very aware of the plight of the Cuban people and we generally sympathize with them and pray for them. I we know the hurricane, the recent hurricane did not help. But however, Madam Speaker, we are still a small island. Our resources are limited. And as such, first and foremost, we do have a responsibility to the people of the Cayman Islands. <coughs> and we can no longer allow for this issue in Cuba to continue to impact the Cayman Islands. I mean, on a, on a financial burden that is now being felt when the government needed those resources to also care for our own people. So as the Attorney General noted, we were careful in terms of you know, the, the actions that we were looking at. We were cognizant of our international obligations. And at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, outside of all of that, we are cognizant of the fact that the Cayman Islands people are still good, decent, giving people. And we just wanted to make sure that we did right by any people as opposed to, and, and this is not just Cuba, but there was a time when many Caymanians had to make their living in Cuba and elsewhere across the Caribbean. And we are cognizant of those historical ties. But I, it has reached a point now, as I started out in my debate, that this is not a crisis that needs to be dealt with. And as such, this is one step forward in managing that crisis. I thank you all. The question is that a bill shortly entitled the Customs and Border Control Amendment Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, no? The ayes have it. The Customs and Border Control Amendment Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Supplementary Appropriation, January to December 2020, Bill 2022. The Honorable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of a bill shortly entitled the Supplementary Appropriation, January 2020 to December 2020, Bill 2022. The bill has been duly moved. Does the mover wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker, briefly. I think it's briefly. Madam Speaker, the purpose of this bill is to seek the Parliament's approval for supplementary expenditure, equity investment, executive assets, loans made, and borrowing appropriation changes in respect of the financial year ending the 31st of December 2020. Madam Speaker, there was an earlier supplementary appropriation act with respect to the 2020 financial year, but this earlier act, presented to Parliament by the previous administration, was in respect of appropriation changes that took place during the period 1st of January to the 31st of July 2020. 
the bill now considered, sorry, the bill now being considered by the House is in respect of appropriation changes with respect to the period 1st of August 2020 to the 31st of December 2020. Once an appropriation bill has been approved by the Parliament, it becomes an appropriation act for the particular financial year, and that act establishes what is commonly referred to as the budget for the financial year. There are three ways, Madam Speaker, in which the budget amounts contained in an appropriation act can be changed during the course of a financial year. Firstly, Section 11, Subsection 5 of the Public Management Finance Act, or otherwise known as the PMFA, allows the Cabinet to make such changes. Secondly, Section 12, Subsection 2 of the PMFA allows Finance Committee to approve changes to an established appropriation act. And thirdly, Section 25 of the PMA, PMFA permits Parliament to authorize changes to an already approved appropriation act. Madam Speaker, the majority of the items in the schedule to this bill arise in respect to past government use of one section of the PMFA, Section 11, Subsection 5, with respect to approvals made by Cabinet during the period 1st of August 2020 to the 31st of December 2020. Additionally, the bill also includes items relating to the 2020 financial year that have been approved by Finance Committee in October 2022 with respect to appropriations under the ambit of the Ministry of Health. Madam Speaker, Section 11, Subsection 6 of the PMA states that when a government utilizes Section 11, Subsection 5 to make changes to the Appropriation Act, those changes made by Cabinet under Subsection 11, 5 are to be included in a, separate, in a supplementary appropriation bill which must be presented to Parliament. Additionally, change approved by Finance Committee under Section 12 of the PMFA also needs to be included in a supplementary appropriation bill for a financial year. Madam Speaker, these two, sources these two source changes explain the existence of the bill now before the House. It satisfies a legal requirement that changes to an already approved appropriation act must be incorporated in a supplementary appropriation bill, and that bill must be presented to the Parliament for a scrutiny and possible approval, even though the items in the bill have already been approved by the Finance Committee and the Cabinet. Madam Speaker, I wish to make two additional points. Firstly, the changes set out in the schedule of the bill have already occurred in 2020 and 2022. The changes were approved by Cabinet on a subsection 11, on a section 11, subsection 5 of the PMFA and by Finance Committee on a, on a section 12 of the PMFA. And secondly, it is a reasonable expectation given the circumstances explained in the origin of this supplementary appropriation bill, the Finance Committee consideration of the items in the schedule to the bill will be very swift. Significant financial transactions included in the bill are one, 3.7 million for additional expenditure incurred for geriatric services, which is approved by Finance Committee in October 2022. Also, Madam Speaker, there was 2.2 million for additional expenditure incurred on medical care for persons who are underinsured or requiring medical care that is beyond their insurance coverage, also approved by Finance Committee in October 2022. Third, Madam Speaker, there's 1.2 million for the reclamation and remediation of the Kaibo Public Beach, and four, 800,000 to support the growth and recovery of our sports program. Also included, Madam Speaker, is 600,000 to support the completion of the hurricane shelter in Bodentown. And lastly, Madam Speaker, 500,000 to cover additional costs related to preschool education grants for students who qualify for financial assistance. The bill consists of three main parts, Madam Speaker. Clause one provides the name of the proposed act. Clause two speaks to the appropriation authority of the cabinet. And clause three, this, sorry, and, and three, the schedule to the bill which shows the individual items of appropriation changes that the Parliament is being asked to approve. Madam Speaker, it is also important that I point out that not all supplementary appropriations involve expenditure increases. There are a number of decreases to expenditures contained in this bill. I therefore respectfully ask all honorable members to support the bill. This bill is a legal tidy up, up of an administrative exercise. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Does any other member wish to speak? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, just stand to give recognition to uh, what the, the, the Deputy Premier said in presenting the bill. I note that it will get to Finance Committee, but I expect as well that, that the approval process will be quite swift given the nature and uh, the time of uh, you know, these transactions. So just on behalf of the opposition, say that we, we uh, fully support the, uh, the, the bill before the House at this point. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to thank the Honourable Leader of the Opposition and all members of this Honourable House for the tacit approval. Thank you. The question is that a bill shortly entitled the Supplementary Appropriation January 2020 to December 2020 Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no? The ayes have it. The Supplementary Appropriation January 2020 to December 2020 Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Supplementary Appropriation, January to December 2021, Bill 2022. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of a bill shortly entitled the Supplementary Appropriation, January 2021 to December 2021, Bill 2022. The bill has been duly moved. Does the mover of the bill wish to speak thereto? Yes, Madam Speaker, briefly. Madam Speaker, the purpose of this bill is to seek the Parliament's approval for supplementary expenditure, equity investment, executive assets, loans made, and borrowing appropriation changes in respect to the financial year ending 31st of December 2021. Once an appropriation bill has been approved by Parliament, it becomes an appropriation act for a particular financial year, and that act establishes what is commonly referred to as the budget for that financial year. Madam Speaker, there are three ways in which the budget amounts contained in an Appropriation Act can be changed during the course of a financial year. Firstly, Madam Speaker, Section 11, Subsection 5 of the Public Management and Finance Act, otherwise known as the PMFA, allows the Cabinet to make such changes. Secondly, Section 12, Subsection 2 of the PMFA allows Finance Committee to approve changes to an Established Appropriation Act. And thirdly, Section 25 of the PMFA permits Parliament to authorize changes to an already, to an already approved Appropriation Act. Madam Speaker, this bill arises in respect to the government's use of two sections of the PMFA, Section 11, Subsection 5, and Section 25. Madam Speaker, Section 11, Subsection 6, and Section 25 of the PMFA state that when a government utilizes Section 11, Subsection 5, or Section 25 of the PMFA, respectively, to make changes to an Appropriation Act, those changes made by Cabinet on the Subsection 11.5 and the proposed changes approved by Cabinet pursuant to Subsection 25 of the PMFA are to be included in a, in a supplementary appropriation bill which must be presented to Parliament. Madam Speaker, this explains the existence of the bill now before the House. It satisfies the legal requirement that changes to an already approved appropriation act must be incorporated in a supplementary appropriation bill, and that bill must be presented to Parliament for a scrutiny and possible approval. Madam Speaker, I wish to make two additional points. Firstly, the vast majority of changes set out in the schedule to the bill have already occurred. The changes are processed shortly after they are approved by Cabinet under Section 11, Subsection 5 of the PMFA. And secondly, it is the government's reasonable expectation that, given the circumstances explained in the origin of the Supplementary Appropriation Bill, Finance Committee's consideration of the items in the schedule to the bill will be efficient. Madam Speaker, this bill indicates changes that can be categorized as follows. One, items on the schedule to the bill that were approved by Cabinet for presentation to the Parliament 
and Finance Committee for its review, scrutiny and possible approval that is being done in accordance with Section 25 of the PMFE, and two, items on the schedule to the bill where Cabinet has this legal import to do under, subsection, under Section 11, Subsection 5 of the PME may change this to budget during the 2021 financial period. Madam Speaker, the government always endeavors to match a request in an increase in expenditure with a corresponding reduction to expenditures, though this is not always possible 100% of the time. The supplementary requests arise mainly as a result of a specific government decision taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Significant financial transactions, including the bill, are as follows. 63.7 million financial assistance to displaced tourism workers and non caymanian residents affected by closure of the island's border due to COVID-19. An additional 49.6 million for purchase of supplies to mitigate COVID-19, including other specific government decisions taken in response to COVID-19. Madam Speaker, there was also 28.9 million for tertiary medical care at local and overseas institutions, 10 million for an operational support for Cayman Islands Airport Authority, 8.8 million to fund remaining commitments for the long-term residential mental health facility, 8.5 million for local and overseas scholarships, 7 million for operational support for Cayman Airways Limited, 4 million to assist small and micro businesses that have been negatively impacted by the economic effects of Tropical Storm Grace, 4 million for upgrades to existing roads, 3.1 million for the public schools meal program, and 3 million to assist residents in need of housing repairs as a result of Tropical Storm Grace. Madam Speaker, the bill consists of three main parts. Clause 1 provides the name of the proposed act. Clause 2 speaks to the appropriation authority of the Cabinet and the schedule to the bill which shows the individual items of appropriation changes that the Parliament is being asked to approve. Madam Speaker, it is also important that I point out that not all supplementary appropriations involve expenditure increases. There are a number of decreases to the expenditures contained in this bill. I therefore respectfully ask all honourable members to support this bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just briefly to express our support for the appropriation bill that's now before this Honourable House, uh, recognising too that we'll uh, discuss it again in Finance Committee once uh, proceedings here are completed. So thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition and all members of this Honorable House for their tacit support and approval. Thank you. The question is that a bill shortly entitled Supplementary Appropriation January 2021 to December 2021 Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Supplementary Appropriation January 2021 to December 2021 Bill 2022 be given a second reading. As has been given a second reading. Criminal Justice Offenders Assistant Investigations and Prosecutions Bill 2022. The Honorable Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the second reading 
of a bill, a short title, Criminal Justice Offenders Assisting Investigations and Prosecutions Bill 2022, and a long title, a bill for an act to provide for immunity from prosecutions and for reduced sentences in certain circumstances and for incidental and connected purposes. The bill has been duly moved. Does the mover wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker, thank you. Madam Speaker, this is a relatively short bill, but of some importance. Madam Speaker, I rise on behalf of the government to present the Criminal Justice Offenders Assisting of Investigation and Prosecutions Bill 2022. The purpose of this legislation, Madam Speaker, is to provide a statutory framework which, among other things, would empower the Director of Public Prosecutions to grant immunity from prosecution in certain cases, to allow the court to make sentence reduction and guilty pleas in certain circumstances, and to facilitate review of certain sentences by the courts, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I think it is common knowledge that the Cayman Islands have for some time been undergoing a change in crime dynamic and a cultural shift where, unfortunately, Madam Speaker, violence and the use of firearms have radically impacted the willingness of persons to provide information to the police and to otherwise assist in certain investigations. And so, Madam Speaker, on a number of occasions, the progress of criminal investigations and prosecutions have been impeded or stymied as a result of witnesses fearing reprisals and, as a consequence, Madam Speaker, refusing to assist the police in bringing criminals to justice. Madam Speaker, to address the issue regarding the failure to engage witnesses. In 2010, this parliament enacted the Criminal Evidence Witness and Immunity Act. That act, Madam Speaker, provides, among other things, for the protection of witnesses by permitting the making of an investigation and immunity order by a magistrate in relation to a person who is willing unable to assist the police with criminal investigations into certain types of crime where the persons would not otherwise do so for fear of harm. And I'll speak of the Criminal Evidence Witness Anonymity Act has successfully been used in offenses of murder or possession of unlicensed firearm and robbery or possession of imitation firearm with intent. However, Madam Speaker, that piece of legislation is not always appropriate in cases where, for example, the witness is said to have been on the fringes of gang association. So, Madam Speaker, in response to a request from the Director of Public Prosecutions, as well as to public comments on the need to find varied ways of stemming the growth of crime in the islands, the Law Reform Commission undertook a review of the statutory regulation of accomplice evidence, also referred to as King's evidence at the time. Of, um, well, King's evidence, no Madam Speaker, but when the exercise started, it was labeled the Queen's evidence uh, during the consultation period. And Madam Speaker, for, for the benefit of members, King's evidence is really evidence from someone who has been accused of committing a crime and that person give evidence against a person who's accused with them in order to have, and, and could result in that person's sentence being reduced or having provided that assistance, Madam Speaker. I think in some places it's called plea bargain. Um, Madam Speaker, in most Commonwealth countries, as in the Cayman Islands, 
A prosecutor has the power to secure the cooperation of potential co-defendants in an informal manner, as well as the power to determine whether or not, Madam Speaker, to bring criminal charges, and if so, what charges to bring. And so, Madam Speaker, it is argued that the statutory codification of King's evidence would allow prosecutors to be more effective, not only in obtaining accomplice evidence, but also in securing convictions where appropriate, Madam Speaker, the evidence exists, and of course allow the process to be transparent and well regulated, Madam Speaker, as it, as it obtains in dealing with accomplice. The cooperation of accomplice, Madam Speaker, sorry. <clears throat> so, Madam Speaker, it is on this basis that the Law Reform Commission carried out a comprehensive review of the law relating to King's evidence. The review of the Commission, Madam Speaker, comprised the preparation of a scoping paper and a consultation draft bill. Thereafter, Madam Speaker, discussion paper and a further consultation draft bill that were published for stakeholders and public com consultation. Madam Speaker, the discussion paper gave a summary of this area of the law in the Cayman Islands, or the proposed law in the Cayman Islands too, also the state of the law in the UK, the USA, Jamaica, among other places. And that discussion paper, Madam Speaker, also summarized the main points of the proposed bill. The Cayman Islands position, Madam Speaker, was examined against the background of the United Kingdom's approach, which was to codify the use of King's evidence. We also examined the plea deal system that was adopted in the United States of America. Madam Speaker, in the Cayman Islands, currently, a prosecutor has the power to secure the cooperation of potential co-defendants in an informal manner and to determine whether or not to bring criminal charges and what charges to bring. This discretion, of course, of the DPP is enshrined in Section 57 of the Cayman Islands Constitution, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the existing practice is that should an accomplice inquire of the police as to any benefit if the accomplice assists the Crown the police will usually advise that person that no agreements or promise can be made, promises can be made and that it is a matter for the courts to decide on sentencing of the accomplice. However, Madam Speaker, the police will undertake to bring, the, bring to the attention of the court any such assistance by way of a sealed envelope containing a memorandum from a senior police officer. The seal envelope procedure, Madam Speaker, endeavors to protect the cooperating accomplice and the extent of the assistance provided, Madam Speaker, cannot be, the extent of the assistance provided cannot be stated in open court as it may have implications for the safety of the cooperating accomplice, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, while such informal procedures have yielded positive results, it has been argued quite properly that the broad discretion afforded to the police and the courts can lead to inconsistency, Madam Speaker. So although there is no evidence of such inconsistency in this jurisdiction, Madam Speaker, there is perhaps a need for more formality to ensure transparency and accountability of the process. And so, Madam Speaker, it is noteworthy that both the United Kingdom and Jamaica have codified their practices in relation to accomplished evidence in recent years. Madam Speaker, the Commission's review process culminated in a final report submitted to the AG on the 30th of November 2021 and was accompanied by the Criminal Justice Offenders Assisting of Investigations and Prosecutions Bill 2022, which is currently before the House, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, against that background, I will now just go on, go on to mention the relevant clauses of the bill briefly. Clause one, as usual, Madam Speaker, 
speaks to the short title and the commencement of the legislation. Clause two is the interpretation clause, and it defines some of the important terms used throughout the legislation, Madam Speaker, such as the types of offenses covered, the definition of immunity notice, as well as the definition of term negotiation, Madam Speaker. Clause three, Madam Speaker, provides that nothing in the legislation shall affect the right of an accused to plead guilty to a charge without having to enter into any undertaking under the legislation. In other words, Madam Speaker, an accused person is not under any obligation to enter into any agreement with the prosecution. Madam Speaker, Clause 3 also provides that, save as expressly agreed otherwise by the DPP, nothing in the legislation affects the powers conferred upon the DPP by Section 57 of the Constitution. Madam Speaker, Clause 4 empowers the DPP in exceptional circumstances to offer a person immunity from prosecution. In such a case, Madam Speaker, an immunity notice is given to the person, and where an immunity notice is given, no proceedings that relate to the offence specified in the notice can be brought against that person, Madam Speaker, except in circumstances that is spelled out in the notice, in the notice itself. Madam Speaker, it is critical to note that an immunity notice will cease to have effect if there is non-compliance with any other conditions specified in the notice. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, Clause 5 provides that the director may offer an offender what something that is known as a restricted use undertaking. A restricted use undertaking, Madam Speaker, prevents information that is describing that undertaking from being used against a person in the proceedings to which the clause applies. This includes not only criminal proceedings, Madam Speaker, but also civil forfeiture proceedings under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Madam Speaker, as for an immunity notice, a restricted use undertaking ceases if the person fails to comply with any conditions specified in the undertaking. Clause 6, Madam Speaker, deals with a reduction in sentence where a defendant has pleaded guilty to the relevant offence and has, Madam Speaker, under a written agreement made with the DPP, assisted or offered to assist the investigator or the prosecutor in relation to that or any other offence. Clause 6, Madam Speaker, also allows a court to consider the extent and nature of the defendant's assistance in determining the appropriate sentence. And so if the court discounts a sentence because of the defendant's assistance, the court must state in open court that the sentence was discounted and what the greater usual sentence would have been, Madam Speaker. Clause 7, Madam Speaker, deals with the review of a sentence where the convicted person subsequently provided assistance or further assistance to the investigator or prosecutor of an offence. The provision, Ms. Madam Speaker, allows the DPP to refer the case back to the court that imposes sentence initially for a review. Madam Speaker, Clause 8 empowers the court to exclude the public from proceedings relating to review of a sentence under Clause 7. The court may also prohibit the publication of any matter relating to the proceedings. This operates, Madam Speaker, to protect the convicted person from reprisals for providing further assistance. Madam Speaker, Clause 9 requires the DPP to inform the accused person of their right to legal representation and to apply for legal aid when negotiating an immunity or a reduced sentence or a restricted use undertaking. This clause, Madam Speaker, obviously seeks to recognize the equality of arms principle by ensuring that an individual is accorded the right to legal representation as provided for under Section 7 of the Constitution when engaging in such negotiations, Madam Speaker. 
So the appropriate safeguards are in place. Madam Speaker, Clause 10, Clauses 10 and 11 are intended to ensure confidentiality of matters relating to agreements under the Act. And this, Madam Speaker, is understandably of utmost importance in this context. Class 10 also empowers, Madam Speaker, the court to seal the records of negotiation or agreements in the interest of the effective administration of justice. Clause 11 requires that all persons involved in the administration of this legislation shall keep the information, records, and documents relating to the agreements confidential, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Clause 12 empowers the DPP before giving an immunity notice or a restricted undertaking or before agreeing to a reduced sentence to permit a victim of the relevant offense, Madam Speaker, to make written representation on the matter. Madam Speaker, I am sure honorable members will agree that in seeking to secure convictions using this mechanism provided by the legislation, the interests and views of the victim should, victims should always be taken into account. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, Class 12 expressly allows the director to take a victim's representation into consideration when concluding the agreement. And he must, in certain circumstances, Madam Speaker, inform a victim of the substance and reason for the immunity notice or a restricted undertaking or an agreement for reduction in the sentence. Madam Speaker, the legislation is not intended to encroach on the independence and the discretion of our judges and magistrates. As Clause 13 provides that the court is not bound by an immunity notice or a restricted use undertaken or an agreement for the reduced sentence, Madam Speaker. It is ultimately a matter for the court. Finally, Madam Speaker, Clause 14 provides that the cabinet, after consultation with the DPP, may make regulations to give effect to this act. Madam Speaker, as the nature and extent of violent crime in the islands evolves, it is important for our laws and legal processes to evolve to meet emerging, ch emerging ch challenges. The government believes that this bill will enhance the ability of prosecutors to secure convictions, as well as provide the transparency and consistency that is lacking in the current informal approach to offenders' assistance, Madam Speaker. I think, Madam Speaker, and I urge member to find that this is a common sense approach, Madam Speaker, in seeking to deal with the issue. Accordingly, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I now seek the approval of this House, this Parliament, in approving the Justice Offenders Assisting Investigation and Prosecution Bill 2022. And, Madam Speaker, before I take my seat, I want to thank the Law Reform Commission, Mr. Griffith and his team, as well as the Chairman of the Commission, Mr. Hector Robinson, Case King's Council and his team um, of commissioners, Madam Speaker, as well as all those who took time to comment during the various consultation process, Madam Speaker. As I said, I think this is a common sense approach to dealing with certain violent crimes and criminals. And Madam Speaker, I certainly commend the bill to this parliament. I thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? The Honorable Member for Red Bay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wish to thank the Honorable Attorney General for his comprehensive presentation of this important bill. As I think he said during the presentation, this is formalizing for the Cayman Islands, what I think the Americans call plea bargain arrangements. It, the bill goes much further than just that. It deals with consequential matters. But in this day and age where, where the, the crimes that are being committed are increasingly complex and the threat to persons who give evidence is ever more serious and real. I do believe that we have, I hate to use the word 
the verb resort, but we have to resort to measures such as these to encourage the giving of evidence by persons who are accomplices or may be accomplices in particular crimes in order to get the principal offenders properly convicted and sent away for the required period. And so, Madam Speaker, I am not going to go into the clauses. I, I didn't see anything that sprang out at me as being potentially problematic. And uh, I think I can safely indicate on behalf of the opposition our support for the bill. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I understand that we wish to thank the honorable member from Red Bay for his support on behalf of the opposition and to thank all honorable members, Madam Speaker, for their support as well. Thank you. The question is that a bill shortly entitled Criminal Justice Offenders Assisting Investigations and Prosecutions Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Criminal Justice Offenders Assisting Investigations and Prosecutions Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Contempt of Court Bill 2022. The Honorable Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of a bill, short title of which is a Contempt of Court Bill 2022, the long title of which is a bill for an act to codify certain contempt of court offenses and for incidental and connected purposes. The bill has been duly moved. Does the mover wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Madam Speaker, this unfortunately is a little longer than the last bill, and so I certainly crave members' indulgence as I make my way through this, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I do present this bill on behalf of the government. Um, it's content of Court Bill 2022. And the purpose of the proposed legislation, Madam Speaker, is to streamline measures to ensure the integrity of the judicial process, um, ensure that it is preserved, while at the same time, Madam Speaker, safe, seeking to safeguard the rights of an individual to a fair trial and freedom of expression as enshrined in the Constitution, Madam Speaker, in circumstances where, of course, a person is accused of contempt of court. And so. Madam Speaker, this bill was informed by the Law Reform Commission's final report on contempt of court. It is a matter which came by way of referral from the Attorney General back in 2003, Madam Speaker. Right. 19 years, Madam Speaker. It has been, has been a while. <laughs> Madam, Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, for the, for the benefit of those in the public arena who might be unfamiliar with terminology, contempt of court refers to any action or inaction for that matter amounting to interference with or obstruction of are having a tendency to interfere with or to obstruct the due administration of justice. 
And so, Madam Speaker, we are essentially dealing with the protection of the integrity of the court process. Madam Speaker, two developments justified an examination of this branch of the law. The first was the increasing use, or is the increasing use of the internet as a method of communication, not just on a personal basis, Madam Speaker, but as a means of conveying information to the world at large. The internet, Madam Speaker, has replaced newspapers and broadcast as a principal source of information. And this, Madam Speaker, has brought with it the citizen's journalist. As a result, Madam Speaker, it has also brought with it one particular aspect of juror content. That is, Madam Speaker, the risk that jurors, despite the traditional warning from the judge, will be tempted to surf the internet hoping, Madam Speaker, to find some item relevant to the case in respect of which they are sitting as jurors. This act alone, Madam Speaker, could potentially influence the outcome of court proceedings. Madam Speaker, the second development which came later was the enactment of Part 1 of Schedule 2 of the Cayman Islands Constitution, Order 2009, which is the Bill of Rights, Freedom, and responsibilities. The pertinent sections, Madam Speaker, are Section 7, the right to a fair trial, and Section 11, freedom of expression. These sections, Madam Speaker, are particularly relevant to any consideration of the present law of contempt, as while we may seek to safeguard the integrity of the court process, we must not be seen, Madam Speaker, to be encroaching on the fundamental rights of the individual. Madam Speaker, the Law Reform Commission produced three consultation papers on the subject of contempt. The first consult consultation paper sought to address the impact of the developments concerning the Internet and the Bill of Rights, and it also considered whether any, and if so, which parts of the law of contempt, the current law of contempt, merited codification, amendment, are indeed repealed. The second consultation paper, Madam Speaker, dealt with the subjudicial rule. That is, Madam Speaker, the rule restricting or postponing publications, commenting on pending court proceedings until after those proceedings are concluded. Madam Speaker, the issue examined in this paper was how to achieve a balance which recognize the right to freedom of expression and the right to a fair trial. Madam Speaker, the third consultation paper, which was done in July 2016, sought to determine whether the existing law should be substantively left as it is by retaining the court's summary power to preserve the integrity of the proceedings before it but with some new statutory provisions applicable to the majority of cases that ensure that contempt proceedings are conducted fairly, comply with Section 7 of the Bill of Rights, and afford the alleged contempt, no, Madam Speaker, the formal protection under the Criminal Procedure Code. In preparing these papers, Madam Speaker, the Commission was informed by the work of the other law reform commissions in jurisdictions such as Hong Kong, Australia, and the United Kingdom. These consultation papers were made available for public consultation, following which the commission finalized its recommendation and submitted the final report on the contempt of court, on the draft contempt of court bill. Madam Speaker, I must also add that there is a companion bill which is the Penal Code Amendment Bill. It's a very short bill, but it's a companion piece of uh, proposed amendment to the Contempt of Court Bill. Madam Speaker, the final report of the Commission primarily recommends A, the restriction on codification of what is termed the strict liability rule. And I will discuss this rule further, Madam Speaker, when I examine the various clauses of the bill. <coughs> Sorry. But simply put, 
The strict liability rule stipulates, Madam Speaker, that conduct may be treated as contempt of court, regardless of an intent to act in a contemptuous manner. In other words, Madam Speaker, you can be guilty of contempt of court, whether or not you had intended um, to do so, to, to obstruct the proceedings. That's, that's a strict liability. The, it also, Madam Speaker, speaks to the introduction of a provision to ensure that on application for committal, or where the court acts of its own motion, the court, Madam Speaker, will not proceed to consider the guilt or otherwise of the alleged contemnor unless it is first satisfied that the contemnor is or has been afforded the protections afforded by section has been accorded the protections afforded by section 7 of the constitution i spoke madam speaker about the fair trial this is the provision alluded to earlier about the fair trial so madam speaker I will try to summarize the provisions of the bill. And in doing so, Madam Speaker, to point out that the bill, as I said, seeks to codify the strict liability rules along the lines of section one to seven of the UK Contempt of Court Act, 1981, with the necessary modification, Madam Speaker, to reflect the Cayman Islands procedures. Clause 1, Madam Speaker, as we just speak to the short title. Clause 2, Madam Speaker, is a definition clause which features key terms that are pertinent to the issue being considered. These include the Constitution, of course, Madam Speaker, the court, and the definition of proceedings. Clause 3, Madam Speaker, deals with a strict liability rule. Under the strict liability rule, Madam Speaker, conduct may be treated as a contempt of court if it interferes with the course of justice in the particular proceedings. And this, Madam Speaker, is regardless of whether the person had intended to interfere with the proceedings or not. Madam Speaker, by way of example, the offense committed by breach of the subjudicial rule is an offense of strict liability. The subjudicial rule, Madam Speaker, is something that we all in this parliament are quite familiar with. It is, Madam Speaker, <coughs> requires a restriction or postponement of publications commenting on pending court proceedings until after those proceedings are concluded. Madam Speaker, it is not necessary for the prosecution to establish that the publisher intended to interfere with the conduct of the proceedings in question. Nor is it a defense, Madam Speaker, for the publisher to establish that he or she had no such intention. Again, Madam Speaker, that is because it's, it's a strict liability offense. And so, Madam Speaker, it is sufficient that when objectively viewed, there is a risk that the publication will have that effect, Madam Speaker. That is the state of the current law. Madam Speaker, there is no doubt that this represents the law of the Cayman Islands at the moment. And even in the UK, the principle of strict liability was retained by the UK Contempt of Court Act 1981. Although, as indicated in the consultation paper of the Commission, the scope of the subjudicial rule was restricted in certain respects, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the bill and the clauses to follow seek to identify the, res the respects in which the scope of the subjudicial rule will be applicable and will be restricted, Madam Speaker, to accord with fair due process. I beg your pardon. So clause four, Madam Speaker, limits the scope of district liability rule in several instances. First, Madam Speaker, the strict liability rule will only apply to publications, Madam Speaker. Publications include any writing, speech, or other communication which is addressed to the public 
our section of the public, uh, which have in regard to the nature of the communication or the identity of the person or persons to whom the publication was addressed, that person making the communication should have been aware or would or would likely come to would have sorry should have come would have come to the attention <clears throat> of the public or section of the public. I'll say that again, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the publication include any writing, speech, or other communication which is addressed to the public or a section of the public, or which have in regard to the nature of the communication or the identity of the persons or persons to whom the publication was addressed, the person who is doing the, public, the publication should have been aware or would or would likely come to the attention of the, that it would come to the attention of the public or section of the public. Madam Speaker, the strict liability rule will apply to a publication which creates a substantial risk. So it's not just any publication, Madam Speaker. It is one which will create a substantial risk that the course of justice in the proceedings in question will be seriously impeded or prejudiced if the publication is done. The strict liability rule will also apply, Madam Speaker, to publications made when proceedings are active within the meaning of Clause 5. I will deal with that, what is considered active, Madam Speaker, in a moment. In cases where the strict liability rule applies, Madam Speaker, the court may order any publisher or a distributor of the publication to take such steps as may be specified in the order to ensure that the publication does not come to the further attention of the public so long as those proceedings remain active. Madam Speaker, we have seen instances of that um, right here in this very jurisdiction where the court has put an embargo on certain publication of certain proceedings. Madam Speaker, a strict liability rule will not, however, apply in the case of a publication in, in existence before the proceedings became active. Nonetheless, Madam Speaker, it is still within the inherent powers of the court to order the removal of the publication. As far as penalty goes, Madam Speaker, a publisher or a distributor who fails to comply with an order of the court commits an offense of contempt of court and will be dealt with accordingly. And the penalty for contempt under the legislation, Madam Speaker, I will discuss in a bit. <coughs> I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Madam Speaker, I mentioned earlier on about active proceedings and I said I would deal with that. Madam Speaker, Clause, clause 5 of the bill defines when proceedings are to be considered as active. In this regard, Madam Speaker, proceedings are categorized into whether it's an appellate proceedings or as a criminal or other proceedings. So criminal proceedings become active, Madam Speaker, if there is an arrest without a warrant, or the issue of a warrant for an arrest, or the issue of a summons or a warrant to appear, or the service of an indictment or other documents specifying a charge. So, Madam Speaker, the proceedings is considered active if a warrant has been, um, if an arrest, a person has been arrested without a warrant, or a warrant has been issued for the person's arrest, or the issue of a summons to appear, or where the person has been charged, there's an indictment that has been served on that person. In contrast, Madam Speaker, criminal proceedings are inactive where the person has been acquitted or upon the giving of any other verdict, whether by jury or by the court, or the proceedings have been discontinued by operation of law. In those circumstances, the proceedings are no longer active, Madam Speaker, and there can be, there can be no contempt in those circumstances. Madam Speaker, in the case of an appellate proceedings relating to criminal proceedings, the strict liability rule would apply where the court remits a case to the court below and orders a new trial. Madam Speaker, in the case of a trial in a grand court, the proceedings are active when the action is set down for trial until those proceedings 
are disposed of or discontinued or withdrawn. Clause 6, Madam Speaker, provides for defenses to the strict liability rule. So, Madam Speaker, it is a defense to the strict liability rule where a person can prove that at the time of the publication or the distribution, he or she took all reasonable care and did not know or had no reason to suspect that relevant proceedings were still active. In addition, Madam Speaker, it is a defense if having taken all reasonable care, the person did not know or had no reason to suspect that the publication or distribution contained a matter which would compromise an active proceedings. Clause 7, Madam Speaker, deals with the contemporaneous publication of a report of proceedings held in public and the limits of such publication. Madam Speaker, generally a person does not commit an offence of contempt of court under the strict liability rule in respect of a fair and accurate report of legal proceedings held in public, published contemporaneously and published in good faith, Madam Speaker. So, no offence at all where the proceedings has been held in public and there's a fair and accurate proceedings of the and, sorry, publication is done in good faith. However, Madam Speaker, the court may, where it appears to be necessary, however, Madam Speaker, the court may, where it appears to be necessary for avoiding a substantial risk of prejudice to the administration of justice in those proceedings or in any other proceedings pending or imminent, to order that the publication of any report of the proceedings or any part of the proceedings be postponed until such time as the court has seen fit. Again, Madam Speaker, I mentioned that this is not, a, this is not a, something new that happens now, depending on certain proceedings, Madam Speaker, especially if they're sensitive, relates to children or vulnerable persons or whatever, or for some other reasons, the court can order that the proceedings be, publication be embargoed. Madam Speaker, Clause 8 deals with the discussion of public affairs and provides that a publication made as or as part of a discussion and in good faith of public affairs or other matters of general public interest is not to be treated as a contempt of court under the strict liability rule if the risk of impediment or prejudice to particular legal proceedings is merely incidental to the discussion itself, not substantial risk. Madam Speaker. Clause 9 is a savings clause and provides that nothing in clauses 3 to 8 of the legislation prejudices any defense available at common law to a charge of contempt of court under the strict liability rule. So, Madam Speaker, those defenses that are available at common law still retain, even though the law is being codified. Madam Speaker, Clause 10 sets out the requirements for instituting contempt proceedings, and this is quite important as well, Madam Speaker, because we spoke about <coughs> the whole issue of ensuring proper due process. So Clause 10, Madam Speaker, before proceedings for a charge of contempt of court under the strict liability rule may be instituted, the consent of the director of public prosecution or a motion of a court having jurisdiction to deal with the contempt is required. Clause 11, Madam Speaker, deals with publishing information relating to proceedings conducted in private. Madam Speaker, the publication of information relating to proceedings before court sitting in private, some of us lawyers refer to that as the chamber's proceedings, Madam Speaker, will not of itself be contempt of court except where the proceedings relate to certain specified matters, such as the wardship or adoption of a child, or where the proceedings are brought under the Mental Health Act, or under Section 14 of the Grand Court Act, Madam Speaker. This is matters dealing with um, persons who are concerned with mental incapacity. 
Madam Speaker. Those circumstances where the matters are conducted in private um, and their publications, Madam Speaker, it will be deemed to be a contempt of court. Adoption and worship of children or proceedings dealing with <coughs> under the Mental Health Act or persons with mental incapacity. <coughs> so, Madam Speaker, this provision deals with guardianship and conduct of affairs of persons suffering from such illnesses. Madam Speaker, the reason for these restrictions of publication in those circumstances is obviously due to the sensitive nature of any such proceedings. Clause 12, Madam Speaker, sets out the procedure for dealing with contempt of court. This clause is especially important, as, as I mentioned earlier as well, in that it seeks to ensure compliance with the fundamental rights for fair trial, as enshrined in Section 7 of the Bill of Rights. Under the clause, Madam Speaker, the court can no longer deal summarily with contempt proceedings. The court, Madam Speaker, will not be permitted to proceed to determine whether or not a person is guilty of contempt of court. Unless, Madam Speaker, it is first satisfied that the alleged contempt is provided with full details of the nature of the, and cause of the accusation, the court also has to be satisfied that the person has had adequate time and facilities to prepare his or her defense. The court will have to ensure that the person has access to legal representation and legal aid where the person is unable to afford legal representation. It has to ensure that the person has had an opportunity to examine witnesses, Madam Speaker, and where necessary to seek to obtain attendance and the examination of such witnesses and on that person's behalf. And also have to ensure, Madam Speaker, before proceeding against a person, that he has had the free assistance of an interpreter if the alleged contender cannot understand or speak the language used in court, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in conducting contempt proceedings, the court will continue to have jurisdiction to exercise its powers with respect to attendance of witnesses, refusal to give evidence, or penalties for non-attendance or refractory witnesses. Madam Speaker, example, if a witness is called to give evidence and a witness goes into the witness box and having been sworn, refused to answer question, refused to answer question, the court still has that retain that power to deal with that witness as well. That witness, Madam Speaker, has not been taken away. Clause 15, Madam Speaker, sets out the penalty for contempt of court. So a person who commits an offense of contempt of court is liable on conviction to a fine or to imprisonment for a term of two years or to both, Madam Speaker. And the court has the power, Madam Speaker, if it believes that it is in the interest of justice to do so, may order the early discharge of a person who has been in prison for contempt of court. Madam Speaker, there are some other minor clauses in the bill, but section 27 of the Grand Court Act Madam Speaker, Section 27 of the Grand Court Act 2015 provides for the summary powers of the court to deal with content of court. So under the current Section 27, the court has the power to order the arrest of and try summarily any person who is accused of any content of court or any act insulting to or scandalizing the court or disturbing the proceedings. With the repeal of Section 27, Madam Speaker, the Grand Court can no longer try a matter without affording or according the accused person all the rights attached to a fair trial, Madam Speaker. Of course, the court will, will retain its inherent jurisdiction otherwise, Madam Speaker. Finally, Madam Speaker, Clause 15 contains, trans, contains transitional provision. And so, Madam Speaker, the government believes that this piece of legislation will streamline the matters that surround the preservation of the court's inherent jurisdiction to protect the integrity of its process, but, Madam Speaker, importantly, protecting the fundamental rights of individuals 
uh, ensuring that they are entitled to and are afforded due process, Madam Speaker, if seeking to, put, to prosecute them for contempt. Madam Speaker, this is, it took 19 years. Um, it has been quite a bit of discussion with not just members of the public, Madam Speaker, newspapers, others have been asking for the law to be clarified, Madam Speaker. And so this is an attempt to codify the provision, provide, and provide certainty, Madam Speaker, as to what will and will not be contempt. And most importantly, Madam Speaker, if there's an allegation of contempt, all the matters will be dealt with by the court, Madam Speaker. The contempt now will have now to be given all the protections under the Bill of Rights. So we'll have to make sure that they have a, um, access to an attorney and if they can't afford one, then there's legal aid. We'll have to make sure that they have access to witnesses, being able to examine those witnesses, be given time to prepare their defense, be given an uh, interpreter if there's a language barrier among other safeguards, Madam Speaker. And of course, all of that it still requires the, the careful eye, if I might put it that way, of the DPP to ensure that that is a matter that ought properly to proceed by way of contempt, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm sorry for the length of the bill, but Madam Speaker, the background is important. And having set it out so carefully so that members can understand um, the full import of it, I commend the bill to this honorable house. Does any other member wish to speak? The Honorable Elected Member for Red Bay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, thanks to the Honorable Attorney General for his comprehensive presentation of this important bill, Contempt of Court Bill 2022. I can't believe that the We've actually been working every month of those last 19 years to produce something as short as this. But, um, Madam Speaker, I think it is, it is a commendable effort to codify an area of the law where there is a great deal of controversy as well as confusion. Increasingly, this belief that there should be no restrictions on freedom of speech or freedom of expression continue to collide with an, an, um, <clears throat> an accused for lack of a better word, right to be treated fairly in the conduct of proceedings, of court proceedings. I believe that codification of, of the law, well, by and large codification, it, it, is not, it is not proposed, I don't think, by virtue of this piece of, or by this bill to um, repeal the inherent jurisdiction of the court to punish for <coughs> contempt. And I think the clause 14 expressly preserves that, that inherent jurisdiction, but by and large to codify the law relating to contempt so that it will become increasingly difficult for those who uh, step over the line to say they were unaware of what the law was in relation to, for, for instance, um, public publications which are sub judice, or publications which affect matters which are sub judice. And so, Madam Speaker, overall, I believe the opposition supports this bill. I have one concern though, Madam Speaker, if the Honorable Attorney General could, could co comment on it when he 
rises to respond. Clause 13, penalties for contempt. Clause 13, one provides a person who commits an offense of contempt of court is liable on conviction in a court of competent jurisdiction to a fine or to imprisonment for a term of two years or to both. That is, to, my, to, my, to me, somewhat unusual that there is no limit provided in respect of the fine. It seems to be an unlimited fine. I am not sure that that's something that we want to that we want to give to the court, the ability to find an unrestricted sum. And it runs, I think, counter to the practice in relation to other pieces of legislation. So um, I would ask the Honorable Attorney General if he would, if he would um, speak to that particular point. But other than that, Madam Speaker, I, I am content I think with the provisions of this bill. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? I'll call on the mover of the bill to exercise his right of reply. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I was trying to find the equivalent UK position, uh, provision, sorry. I know, no, not at all. Um, but it is part of the, the court's inherent jurisdiction, Madam Speaker, to treat with those sort of a contempt. Um, and there's a, there's a provision in the penal code which sort of set the limits, Madam Speaker, depending on the amount of a fine. I'll, I'll find it for the honorable member. I promise to find it for the honorable member. But there's a range of fines, Madam Speaker, starting from $100, I think, to $1 million. And that sets out the, the what's the word I'm looking for, concomitant um, alternative sentence, whether it's six months, 12 months, 18 months or whatever it is. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, I'll certainly just find that for the honorable member and provide it to him before we get to committee, if that's okay. Thanks. But other than that, Madam Speaker, I certainly um, thank the honorable member and the, indeed the House for the support of the, of the bill otherwise. Thank you. The question is that a bill shortly entitled the Contempt of Court Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Contempt of Court Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Penal Code Amendment Bill 2022. The Honorable Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move. Huh? This is very short. Um, <laughs> Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the reading of the second reading of a bill entitled the Penal Code Amendment Bill 2022, which is a short title. But the long title, Madam Speaker, Bill for an Act to Amend the Penal Code 2022 Revision in Relation to Offenses Against the Administration of Lawful Authority and for Incidental and Connected Purposes. The bill has been duly moved. Does the mover wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I mentioned earlier on at the top of the presentation for the contempt of court that there was a companion piece of legislation, Madam Speaker, uh, which is this Penal Code Amendment Bill. It's fairly short, and it's part of the effort to reform the law of contempt, Madam Speaker. 
and as such, as it is consequential amendments arising from the proposed contempt of court bill 2022, which I dealt with just a while ago, Madam Speaker. And it seeks to streamline and strengthen some of the offenses for the punishment, and at the same time, Madam Speaker, to ensure that there is the built-in um, Bill of Rights protection under the, under the, um, the law. So, Madam Speaker, Clause 1, of course, the usual short title. 2, inserts a definition of summons and summoned. Clauses 3 and 4, amend Section 107 of the Penal Code, Madam Speaker, which contain the offenses of conspiracy to defeat justice and interference with witnesses. And a repeal and substitute, Madam Speaker, Section 111 of the Penal Code, <coughs> which relate to offenses of, sorry, judicial proceedings. Madam Speaker, with regards to Section 107, Clause 3 of the Bill provides for the repeal and substitution of 1D, which makes it an offense to do anything in order to obstruct, prevent, pervert, or defeat the course of justice. Madam Speaker, this provision, though, like Section 27 of the Grand Court Act, is expressed in very broad language. But unlike Section 27, it carries a maximum, Madam Speaker, currently, a maximum sentence of seven years. The provision, arguably, Madam Speaker, includes much of the common law of contempt, such as contempt in the face of the court, as well as strict liability rule. However, Madam Speaker, it does not carry the limitations to which those forms of contempt have been now subjected by judicial decisions. And so, Madam Speaker, nor does Section 27 give the accused person the benefit of the modification that I just outlined in respect of the contempt of court um, bill that is proposed here. <coughs> so, Madam Speaker, the repeal of subsection 1D will not result in any person who might have been successfully prosecuted under this paragraph escaping criminal liability given the overlap with the various forms of common law contempt. But as far as penalties are concerned, Madam Speaker, seven years is clearly um, excessive. And so, Madam Speaker, the proposal in the bill um, is considered, is, is proposing four years for the maximum for contempt, um, which would be similar to offenses on the part for the penal code. And the only exception to this four years, uh, Madam Speaker, would be where there is perjury or subordination of perjury, or where a person deliberately fabricated evidence, Madam Speaker. In those circumstances, the maximum is still seven years, Madam Speaker. Um, so, Madam Speaker, it is, I think what is being contemplated, I'm sorry, yeah, what is being proposed, Madam Speaker, is that proposal reduction of penalties for general interference, Madam Speaker, um, five years, and two years for conspiracy, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, class four. Class four of the bill replaces existing 111 as I spoke of, that I spoke about earlier on, as it relates to offenses relating to judicial proceedings. It now proposes a, section, a new section 111. <coughs> and Madam Speaker, subsection 1A and B of the proposed section replacing paragraphs A, B, and I of the new section 111 and section 39 of the summer jurisdiction of which, which is repealed by clause 5 of this bill. These provisions, Madam Speaker, deal with conduct which might otherwise constitute contempt in the face of the court. So the proposed new paragraph, Madam Speaker, is similar to the existing paragraph D, but it is expressing language which is derived from sections 28 and 29 of the summer jurisdiction act 
and also from sections 42 and 45 of the Criminal Procedure Code. These sections, Madam Speaker, deal with what we call defaulting witnesses, but provide for a summary disposal, Madam Speaker. It is, it is desirable, Madam Speaker, that as under the present law, the court retains op the option to simply refer the matter to the relevant prosecuting authority, namely the DPP, rather than, my, Madam Speaker, exercising its summary powers. Particularly, Madam Speaker, as the latter will need to be qualified by reference to protections contained in 7.1. So, um, translation, Madam Speaker, although the court has the inherent jurisdiction there, what is proposed is that in all those circumstances, the court will still refer the matter to the DPP's office for them to determine whether or not, Madam Speaker, there should be a prosecution. That, um, in return, Madam Speaker, will entitle the person to all the protections outlined earlier on, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Clause 6 deals with the transitional provision and so. Again, Madam Speaker, the court believes that these matters, the, the real crux of this is to codify the law relating to contempt of court and to ensure, Madam Speaker, that in treating persons, treating with persons for contempt of court, there are the necessary, the necessary constitutional safeguards as it relates to, as it relates to a fair trial, Madam Speaker, including the right to legal representation and to, Madam Speaker, um, legal aid where the person is unable to afford. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise on behalf of the Opposition to make a very short contribution to the debate on, on this bill, noting that it is a companion uh, bill to the contempt of court bill that we've just finished dealing with and, and passing. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the opposition, just let I state that uh, you know we have no issue at all with the bill and what it is seeking to achieve. I thank the, or the Attorney General for addressing the issue of the reduction in, uh, in penalties and prison terms for those two offenses, because that was, that was really the only question that we had regarding the bill was why that was the case. So I'm grateful to him for him for addressing that. So, Madam Speaker, with those few words, uh, just say that the opposition is happy to support the bill. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does the mover of the bill wish to exercise his right of reply? I thank you, Madam Speaker. I do thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition for, his, um, for the support on behalf of the Opposition. And of course, thanks to the entire government and entire House for the support of the, of the bill, Madam Speaker. I thank you. The question is that a bill shortly entitled the Penal Code Amendment Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Penal Code Amendment Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Anti-Corruption Amendment Bill 2022. The Honorable Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this is my final act. <laughs> For the night. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of a bill the short title, the Anti-Corruption Amendment Bill 2022, and the long title, a bill for an act to amend the anti-corruption 
the Anti-Corruption Act 2019 revision in order to designate the Anti-Corruption Commission as a law enforcement agency in the islands to provide for additional powers of investigating officers to clarify the circumstances in which the Commission shall investigate reports and for incidental and connected purposes. The bill has been duly moved. Does the motor wish to speak there too? Yes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to present this bill on behalf of the government um, and in doing so, Madam Speaker, it would be helpful if I provide some context on how these proposed amendments came about, Madam Speaker, or indeed most of them. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, the Anti-Corruption Act was first enacted in 2008. I think it came into effect in 2010. Came into effect in 2010. Since then, Madam Speaker, it has been administered by the Anti-Corruption Commission, as well as the Office of the DPP, which ultimately handles rulings and prosecution under the Act. Madam Speaker, the interfacing by the ACC, the Anti-Corruption Commission, and the DPP's office with the Act has provided them with a unique opportunity of observing the working of the legislation, including observing areas, Madam Speaker, in which they think the legislation can and should be amended to improve effectiveness and efficiency. This prompted the Anti-Corruption Commission to submit a number of suggested amendments to the, to the Act, Madam Speaker. Amendments which primarily formed the basis of the Anti-Corruption Amendment Bill 2022. Accordingly, Madam Speaker, the amendments in the bill consist mostly of, or in large part, of recommendations from the ACC, Madam Speaker. And so the following are the clauses of the bill. Clause one, Madam Speaker, as usual, deals with the commencement as well as the short title. Clause two deals with definition of financial year, which is now, Madam Speaker, would mean 31st of December of each year. Clause three amends section three of the act to clarify that the ACC, Madam Speaker, is in fact a law enforcement agency. This, Madam Speaker, is particularly important because we are advised that in interfacing with other ACC bodies, the Anti-Corruption Commission faces question to clarify whether it is in fact a law enforcement agency or otherwise. And that, Madam Speaker, is important in terms of um, international cooperation, mutual legal assistance, um, assistance, sorry, mutual legal assistance. Madam Speaker, Clause 4, Again, very important, if agreement by Parliament, if agreed by Parliament, it would enable the Anti-Corruption Commission manager to be, to, to be able to delegate to a senior investigating officer the task of accepting and acknowledging compliance. Let, let me just say that again. Accepting and acknowledging complaint, Madam Speaker, made to the Commission. So, as it is now, the administrative manager, um, ordinary civilian person, has that responsibility of receiving, accepting, acknowledging complaints made to the commission. This is simply saying, Madam Speaker, that that person, at the moment is she, will be able to delegate a senior investigating officer to accept such complaints, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, of course, notwithstanding the delegation, that person, would, the manager would still be able to retain the ability to carry out this task should it become necessary. Class 5, Madam Speaker, empowers the ACC officer to search an arrested person where the person has been arrested at a place which is not a pol police station, but only if the arresting officer has reason to believe, Madam Speaker, reasonable grounds, that the arrested person could present a danger to himself, herself, or others, including the arresting officer. 
Madam Speaker, the draft bill also understandably contemplate that the arresting officer will be able to enter and search without a warrant any premises in which the person was arrested or shortly or immediately before he was arrested for the purpose of securing evidence relative to the offense, Madam Speaker, for which the arrest is made. I, if I might just, just clarify this, Madam Speaker, because I think there were some questions around this. Madam Speaker, what I'm saying here is where the Anti-Corruption Commission has information or reason to arrest a person other than at a police station, Madam Speaker, the officer has the authority, as is the case under the Police Act at the moment, has the authority, Madam Speaker, to search that person, this person, see whether he has anything. And it, it makes a lot of sense, Madam Speaker. He could have a weapon or something on it. So the officer ought to be able to search to ensure that there's no such uh, item. And, Madam Speaker, if he is, that person is seen exiting a particular premises and the, the officer has reason to believe that there is evidence in that particular premises which is relevant to the offense for which a person has just been arrested, the investigating officer, this is saying, has the authority, again as under the Police Act, to simply for the purpose of preserving those, uh, those evidence, to enter that premises and to search for that, that particular um, evidence, Madam Speaker, to secure it. And you can understand why, Madam Speaker, because if the, police, if the officer had to leave and go somewhere, find a judge, swear a warrant, come back to find that evidence, then clearly by the time all of that is done, that, that, is, that is gone. But it's only in respect of thing that is relevant for that purpose. Madam Speaker, the Clause 6, I mean Section 4 of the Act to clarify that the Commission does not have to investigate every report made to it. Instead, only need to investigate where they believe that an offense has been committed, Madam Speaker, including where there is an attempt or a conspiracy. Clause 7 is aimed at substituting the current Section 17, which is the offense of abuse of office, Madam Speaker, to, among other things, make it an indictable offense and to increase the penalty to up to five years in certain circumstances. The language has also been amended to make it clear, Madam Speaker, that whereas previously a mental element was implied and the magistrate being learned, but the person who's learned would be aware of that. The case will now be dealt with by jurors, Madam Speaker, and therefore it will start advisable to expressly provide the amended language that there has to be a mental element to the offender's intent. This is standard provision, Madam Speaker, in a criminal offense, unless, of course, it is a strict liability offense. Madam, some, Madam Speaker, some country use the word willfully, knowingly, or intentionally. And again, Madam Speaker, I understand that there are some, there are some concerns in some quarters um, about some article which says that the purpose of this, or the effect of this amendment is to make it harder to prosecute MPs, I think is the language used, for corruption. Madam Speaker, I'm not so sure, unfortunately, how one makes that quantum leap, because the, the legislation speaks about public officers and members of parliament. So it speaks about the thousands of civil servants, those who serve on board, those who serve, it says there are authorities all over the place. So all of those are involved. And the 19 elected members, Madam Speaker, the two elected, um, as well as the civil servants. Madam Speaker, but there seem to be some mis unfortunate misunderstanding uh, of some of these proposals. The current section 17 
Madam Speaker, is a summary offence. Summary offence. So, where I think I better just read it for members of the, if I can. It says, Madam Speaker, abuse of office. A public officer or a member of the Legislative Assembly who does or directs to be done in abuse of the authority of his office any arbitrary act prejudicial to the rights of, other, of another commits an offense and is liable and summary conviction to imprisonment for a term of two years and summary conviction, Madam Speaker. Subsection 2 says, if the acts under subsection 1 is done or directed to be done for purposes of a loan, a reward, advantage, or other benefit, such person commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to imprisonment for a term of three years. Again, the summary offense, Madam Speaker. The proposed provision would say a public officer or a member of the Legislative Assembly who intentionally does or direct to be done. So the word intentionally has been inserted here. Madam Speaker, the, as I mentioned, it's a summary offense which is triable by a magistrate at the moment and who is a trained legal mind. So a magistrate will rightly, readily understand that it's a criminal offense and therefore mental element is required unless it's a strict liability offense, which it is not. The proposed change, Madam Speaker, will now make it an indictable offense to heard by a jury and who are not legally trained. And, Madam Speaker, what we're attempting to do here is to make what was always implied now expressly stated in the legislation. So, Madam Speaker, when dealing with the matter, the court, the judge, will now have to remind the jury that it requires intent for the offense to be committed. Madam Speaker, it was always to be taken that a trained magistrate, as I said, would understand that position. But it cannot be assumed that a jury would understand that, or that it is implied. Madam Speaker, one of the articles sought to suggest that there is a distinction between simply proving a corrupt act and in addition, Madam Speaker, having to now prove that at the time of doing the act, the accused person intended to corruptly abuse his office. Madam Speaker, this line of reasoning, unfortunately, tells me that there is a misunderstanding of the law around this issue. The writer, Madam Speaker, is unfortunately suggesting that there are two separate tests to be fulfilled. Madam Speaker, you can't have a corrupt act without a, a state of guilty mind. That is what makes it corrupt. Corrupt, corrupt, the word corruption in itself means dishonest. Then, that's, that's what it means, so you can't decouple them. If you do a corrupt act, then it means that you're guilty, you have a guilty mind. That's what it means. So, Madam Speaker, the, anybody who, who will Google corruption I, I will see that it's made dishonest, nefarious, without integrity, etc. So, it's not two separate acts, Madam Speaker. It's one and the same thing. So, Madam Speaker, what I would also like to point out to the writer, or writers of those articles, is that the, the persons or those who conceived of the offense, Madam Speaker, um, as outlined in the UN Guide for Anti-Corruption Policies, which is one of the very useful literature dealing with it. And Madam Speaker, I will just lay the relevant page on the, on the, on the table so that the public can have a i read of it. But Madam Speaker, the title is the United Nations Office of Jobs and Crime, the UN Guide for Anti-Corruption Policies. And I'm reading in particular from page 33, where it deals with Article 19, Abuse of Discretion. And the article says abuse of function, rather. 
abuse of functions. And this is the genesis, Madam Speaker, of the current Section 17 of the Anti-Corruption Act. And I just read quickly what it says, Madam Speaker. It says, each state party shall consider adopting such legislative and other measures as may be necessary to establish as a criminal offense when committed intentionally the abuse of functions or position, that is, the performance of or failure to perform an act in violation of laws by a public official in discharge of his or her function for the purpose of obtaining an undue advantage, <coughs> sorry, for himself or herself or for another person or entity. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, this is the genesis of Section 17 of the, of the law. It expresses states that when committed intentionally, the abuse of function or position. So all we do, <laughs> we're not making it up. Um, this is what they, they intended. And so, Madam Speaker, I think, unfortunately, those who are commenting on the provision might not have the benefit of some of this literature and are taking the position that what was being done is something which is, in fact, um, new or unique to certainly what is um, what obtains elsewhere. Um, as I said, Madam Speaker, it has to be, unless it is a strict liability offense, driving without the driver's license, every criminal offense requires a mental element. There has to be an actus and uh, actus reus and a mens rea, Madam Speaker. That's the act of doing something and also the accompanying mental element that goes along with that. So, Madam Speaker, that is the genesis of it. I hope I've managed to clarify the position for, for the readers um, and the authors of those articles, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Clause 8 is intended to amend the current Section 20 to provide an obligation for person, as is any public officer, a member of parliament to whom any loan or reward or benefit in breach of the Act, that public officer or member of parliament should report that fact to the Anti-Corruption Commission at the earliest opportunity. Again, Madam Speaker, this is one of those things that the Commission has been asking for since 2020 or 2019, I think. <clears throat> um, clause 10, Madam Speaker, this is a very important provision aimed at enabling the anti-corruption senior investigators, senior investigating officer, in order to prevent, detect, or detect or for proceedings relating to a crime, Madam Speaker, to request in writing from from the ICT provider in the form of a record, a message, or document, certain, certain information, Madam Speaker, relating to the investigation. And it is an offense, Madam Speaker, to not to comply without reasonable excuse. Or it is an offense to destroy or alter the records, Madam Speaker. Again, similar to powers that the police enjoys, Madam Speaker. Clause 11, Madam Speaker, seeks to make it clear that it is a collective body, that is a commission, and not the investigating officer who has the ultimate power to decline to investigate a matter after the DPP has been consulted and in instances where there is satisfaction that the allegation is frivolous, vexatious, trivial, or not made in good faith. Madam Speaker, Clause 13, <laughs> provide that section 35 will be amended to clarify that when applying poker to any proceeds of corruption, the reference in the poker to an appropriate officer will also include an uh, investigating officer of the Anti-Corruption Commission. Madam Speaker, 
in my view, pretty straightforward provisions which will strengthen the provision of the, the position of the Anti-Corruption Commission investigators and basically align that with what currently obtains for the police under the Police Act, Madam Speaker, so that there doesn't have to be sort of, for obvious reason, um, reliance on police to deal with certain offenses uh, or seek assistance from them. Madam Speaker, I commend this bill to honorable members um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. I thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Oh, the, the Honorable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Honorable Attorney General for his very clear, clear and able presentation um, of this bill, the Anti-Corruption Amendment Bill 2022. Um, Madam Speaker, I think the Honorable Attorney General has, has made it very clear um, as to the substance of the bill and the intentions of the bill in strengthening the Anti-Corruption Commission. And Madam Speaker, that's obviously very important from a uh, public perspective. And Madam Speaker, it, it is from that perspective that I will just briefly comment and that is <clears throat> there, were, there were a couple of really important points that the Attorney General um, mentioned. One was the genesis of the uh, proposed amendments um, that effectively these came about as a result of the operations of the Anti-Corruption Commission uh, since this legislation had commenced um, and the experiences of both the council and the, the investigators. Um, Madam Speaker, the very unfortunate articles that the Honorable Attorney General referred to, um, I think Apparently, um, I think Madam Speaker tended to undermine um, the objectives of the amendments. Um, the Anti-Corruption Commission itself and suggested that, very unfortunately suggested, again counter to the clear indications now that we have had as to the origin of these um, proposed amendments that this um, bill might be, uh, might contain provisions which reflect an attempt by politicians, by members of parliament to uh, prevent the the successful prosecution of members of parliament if there was ever any sort of wrongdoing. And Madam Speaker, that is particularly unfortunate for that kind of representation to be made. And it was not just one article, but it was two articles. And the interesting thing, Madam Speaker, was that there was not just the, there was not just the representation that, you know, there was this nefarious intent, but at the same time, in terms of the first article, um, there was absolutely no mention of the fact that the <coughs> sentence was being, was being extended in order to strengthen the deterrent factor it was, being, it was being increased. So not only was there 
an attempt to suggest that there was a untoward reason for the amendment and a suggestion that the requirement was being changed from effectively one of strict liability to now one of intent, but a requiring intent, which the allegation was that was difficult to prove, but there was not, not even any suggestion in the article in relation to the increased um, sentences. So, Madam Speaker, I am very, um, I'm very happy that the Honorable Attorney General was able to specifically address the, those points. Um, I think they have been addressed by others in the press, and I have certainly um, tried to address it myself. But I'm, I get particularly concerned, Madam Speaker, when um, there is an attempt to try to um, undermine the, the work of, of Parliament and, and to imply or suggest that parliamentarians are trying to look after themselves and look after each other in such an untoward way. I think that's very unfortunate, Madam Speaker. And I think the record and this bill and the very able presentation by the Honorable Attorney General very clearly puts an end to that, um, that interpretation, Madam Speaker. So with that, I indicate my full support. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? I now call on the mover of the bill to exercise his right of reply. Thank you, Madam, Sp <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Premier for his um, contribution and to all Honourable Members, Madam Speaker, for their support of the bill. I certainly thank you. The question is that a bill shortly entitled the Anti-Corruption Amendment Bill 2022 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Anti-Corruption Amendment Bill 2022 has been given a second reading. Members, this looks like a good place for us to take an adjournment. I will call on the Honorable Premier, yes, to move the adjournment. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I was going to encourage that if you didn't indicate so, but Madam Speaker, um, this um, deals with, conveniently deals with, um, all outstanding bills today, and, in, and you know that it is a very um, appropriate time. The hour is late, um, and I suspect that some of us probably still have work to do and, and visits to, to make um, to constituents, etc. So I won't keep anybody any longer. I want to thank all members very much for the contributions made um, and the progress in getting through the, the agenda for bills today. With that, uh, Madam Speaker, I move the adjournment of this um, Honourable House until um, 10 a.m. Wednesday morning. The question is that this House do no adjourn until 10 a.m. on <laughs> Wednesday morning. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. The ayes have it. This Honorable House now stands adjourned until 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning.